Are you interested in building a career in the development and humanitarian sector? Then, Strategia Netherlands is the best option for you. We offer training solutions to the United Nations, governments, NGOs and other development organizations worldwide. Make your online application now for Diploma in Monitoring and Evaluation Diploma in Grants Management Diploma in Conflict Management Diploma in Disaster Management Diploma in Water Sanitation and Hygiene and many more. The cost for diploma courses is 800 euros while postgraduate courses cost 1,200 euros. Visit www.strategianetherlands.nl for more information. Are you interested in building a career in the Okay, I think we can start now. Um, I want, please uh, mute, uh, Nick, please mute uh, everyone for now. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's start uh, this meeting. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining in, uh, wherever you're logging in from. Uh, uh, some of you have been in this forum before. My name is John Caregua. I'm the training director at Strategia Netherlands, based in Rotterdam, Netherlands. I have, um, the focus today is fundraising, and um, I have worked with uh, development uh, projects uh, for over 25 years as a fundraiser. I have personally raised over $5 million and uh, jointly with others over $20 million for projects uh, from UNDP, Global Fund, and other development partners. I want you to welcome, uh, to welcome you to this uh, session. Uh, please um, show us where you're logging from. Uh, you know, please indicate that in the chat where you're logging from, kindly. Uh-huh. Type where you're logging from, so we can tell uh, where you're coming from. Zimbabwe, CCI, Kenya, uh, Jordan. Uh, please continue logging from where you're logging from. I can see, of course, we have Britain, we have United States. Okay. Um, this is the 16th webinar targeting uh, development organizations. We've had webinars on monitoring and evaluation, fundraising, water and sanitation, uh, grants management, project management. And um, today our focus is uh, fundraising. And uh, we have uh, three guests. Uh, we have uh, Scott Washick from uh, Abazu and uh, Jim Wagner. They tell us about uh, fundraising um, uh, platforms that they have that can really benefit uh, nonprofit organizations. We also have um, Evelyn Kibuchi, who is the CEO of Stop TB Partnership Kenya, to give us some tips on fundraising and especially on how to fundraise during these um, COVID uh, challenges. We also have uh, Steve Mushami, who is our fundraising consultant, and will take us through some basics on how to design a proposal. It's very, very important, even as much as you get the tips, you also need to know um, how the fundraising environment works. Uh, after each of those sessions, we will have questions and answers uh, so that uh, you clarify everything that um, uh, the presentations would have told us. Um, what I would like to do is uh, I'd like to invite uh, Scott and Jim uh, to make their presentation. Uh, then from there, we will go to uh, I will invite uh, Rachel and uh, Victorine from Capacity Africa and Strategic Netherlands, who are the sponsors of this webinar, to briefly tell us, uh, um, uh, you know, what um, Strategic and Capacity are doing, and then from there I will invite Evelyn to do her presentation. So, um, uh, Jim, I don't know who goes first. Uh, Scott, maybe then you can introduce Jim. Thank you very much. I know um, it's a night in the U.S. So uh, it's indeed a big honor for you to wake up and do this presentation. So thank you very much. So uh, take the opportunity. Welcome, Jim and Scott. Okay, thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, yeah, my name is Scott, um, and I'm a representative for Abazoo. 
Um, let me introduce uh, Jim Wagner, who is the nonprofit development uh, manager for Abazu, and he will do the preparation. Okay, over to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, um, first of all, let me see if I can get my my uh, my PowerPoint up here so you guys can see it. Okay, can you I'm not hearing anything. Can you guys see can you guys see that? Ah. Yeah, we can see that now, Jim. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um thank you. Thank you, John, for for the invitation. We do appreciate it. And thank every one of you who are here today. Um the job that nonprofits and um and charities are doing around the world is unbelievable. And I wanna say thank you for what you do. And um, what you're doing is the reason that we are here. Uh, we are Avazu, we're the home of the billion dollar raffle. And um, my monitor has just gone out on me. <laughs> and, and so I'm gonna fly by the seat of my pants here uh, in doing this presentation. Uh, and let's see if I can't, uh, can't uh, do it uh, it's going to be a little little different than what i normally do but um uh, let's see okay first of all let me in introduce myself i'm a retired college professor i was a college professor for 33 years um my main goal was i enjoyed helping people did a lot of advising i did um uh, worked for a number of different areas, but I'm retired now, for, at least from teaching. Uh, and, and But because of my background, uh, I was approached by Avizu. And again, we're the home of the $1 billion raffle, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, they have a new and innovative approach to philanthropy, something that's never been heard of before. And um, because of that, uh, they're gonna, we're going to be able to raise... Um, $3 billion for disaster relief and charities around the world during the next year. You know, and I thought, well, wow, what can you do with, just think about that, $3 billion. Uh, what can you do with $3 billion? Um, how many people could you help? Even within the, in the age of, uh, of COVID. Um, so I was very interested, but I had some questions. Um, that's a lot of money to be raised in a very short period of time. But I was, I was interested because I know that charities are facing many, many difficult problems. Uh, so I, I ask you a question, why are you here tonight? What, what are the concerns that bring you to this, to this webinar tonight? Um, here's a few of them. Uh, we, first of all, we know that charities need money now more than ever. Um, and it's not just for the disaster relief, it's for ongoing crises like clean water and children with uh, def deformities and things like that. So we know that, that there's a great need for, for funds for, for nonprofits and charities around the world. So let's look at these. Uh, how many of these can you relate to? Um, uh, money, not enough money for worthy projects, uh, volunteers, financial supporters, uh, better fundraising programs, uh, especially those that have more than one-time gifts. Um, sources of major donations. If you needed $25,000 in an emergency or if you had uh, something that was very dear to your heart that you needed money for, do you know where to get that kind of money? Uh, how about more exposure for your organization? Well, I'd be very surprised if you can't relate to most, if not all of these, and maybe even more. Uh, and if you do, uh, I'd tell you to please pay close attention to what I have to say because uh, our, our organization can address all these concerns. Um, first of all, let me just tell you the true reason that we do the billion dollar raffle. First of all, we don't believe in gambling. Most organizations don't, but there's a lot of excitement with a lottery, which would be gambling. But so a raffle does, it keeps the excitement of a lottery, but without the negative aspects. Uh, and it's just a means to an end. Um, if you ever notice a, with, a, with a raffle, I'm, I'm sorry, with a lottery, the, as the prize gets big, bigger, uh, people spend much more money trying to win it. 
And um, so, um, so we put the prize as big as you can get, $1 billion, first place prize, $1 billion. Uh, and it, it's, there will be one winner of this prize. Now, one, a couple of things that we do that, that, that are a lot different than, than lotteries is people can only buy one ticket. And um, because we know in lotteries, the people who have the most money are usually the ones that win it because they can buy more tickets and they have a better chance to win. So we have a we have a, pro, a process that allows people to be a winner without having to spend a lot of money to do it. Um, but we know that we've, we're going to sell 50 million tickets and they're going to sell out quickly, even at one, with one per person. Here's the thing, though, of the money that we raise, 70 percent of what we raise, it goes into an escrow account that we can't even touch until the raffle to account for prizes and donations. So um, this is gonna allow us to become an ATM machine for disaster relief and charities. And our ultimate goal is we wanna help you. Uh, went through all that to say, hey, we're here to help you. We have, we have a plan that we can, that, that's already been put in place that we're gonna be able to help charities around the world with disaster relief and with the projects that you're currently working on. And it's not just with money. So. We have a little bit of a glitch that I'm just going to address here because uh, it does it does pertain to what why we're doing what we're doing. Um, the glitch is this: this is a novel program, and there's not yet a license to op operate a magnitude of this uh, a raffle of this magnitude in the United States and in some other countries. And maybe some of your countries you can't you can't uh, sell tickets to a, to a raffle. Um, however, the answer is we can give them away, and that's what we're doing. We are working with. Uh, organizations like yours to um, to help us spread the word about the raffle. And what we're doing is we are offering immediate help by giving you free tickets to the raffle. Um, and you, you'll see that in just a second. The, the amount of tickets that you get depends on the size of your organization um, because you're not going to be able to give away larger as, as smaller organizations aren't going to be able to give away as much as larger organizations do. So, but um, um, you can use them for your fundraising programs. How, if programs that are already in place, you can just add it in there. They just can't be sold individually. What you can do is, is you can attach it to another item that can be sold and you can auction it off. For instance, let's say you're uh, raising money for clean water. Well, if you, let's say you, you put together a sweatshirt, a, a t-shirt that said, uh, help us raise money for water in Africa, clean water in Africa. Well, you could put that, that, that shirt up for on, a, on an auction and say, we're gonna put this in auction and attached to this shirt is a free ticket to the billion dollar raffle. And the nice part about it, any money that you can raise from that is yours to keep. Um, we're not interested in making money from you. We wanna make money for you. So um, here's how we do it. We have packages. Um, and I don't know if you can see, let me, let me see if I can move. Well, I, yeah, we can see Jim. Okay. Can you see with, even with the, the, the people in the side there? Cause I, 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 I'll just skip that. All right. Um, we have five different packages, uh, depending on the size of your organization, um, package A and B are for smaller organizations, C and D, a D and E are for larger organizations. Uh, we'll focus on C cause that's our most popular one. Uh, now, first of all, let me say this. You may look at this and you may say, well, our organization is really small. Uh, we wouldn't qualify for any of these. That's okay. We want you to apply to our program anyway so you can get into our system. So even if you don't qualify, because this is all computer, uh, computer regulated, uh, I, I should have said this up front, because of what we're doing, this is a highly, highly regulated uh, operation. We have to go through many regulators, get approvals for the things that we want to do. And um, so as we're moving through this, we have to, um, we have to, everything has to be approved by regulators. So uh, you may be saying, well, I don't, I don't have a, um, I don't have a, um, uh, my, my organization doesn't qualify for any of these. Go ahead and apply anyway, because we can still work with you and help you with, um, with, with, um, uh, down the road when you need when you need money you can apply it because you'll be already in our system but basically what we're looking for is organizations that have a certain amount of donations they make certain uh, social media posts and, and they have an international presence 
we we uh, we give the uh, the tickets away to you in twenty percent disbursements. So, like in the middle package, we're going to give you fifteen hundred if you're a class C package C uh, organization, and you're going to get uh, three hundred at a time. So um, that's that's how that's how we're going to we're going to give you those tickets, and you you can use them for whatever you want. Um, so also, but that will help with a with a small with something maybe small but how would you like to be uh, helped in a big way um how would you like to be rewarded if any of the tickets that your organization gives away and you're going to be giving away hundreds uh, let's say they turn out to be the winner of one of the top four prizes well let's look at the, let's look at what the top four prizes are uh, obviously first prize is a billion second prize is not bad we're going to have 100 one million dollar winners. Um, so this is starting to get exciting. Uh, we're also going to have a hundred, five hundred thousand or half million dollar winners, and we're going to have five hundred, one hundred thousand dollar winners. Now those are those are big prizes, and any organization would be grateful for any of those. So we have seven hundred. We have seven hundred prizes that um, that if you give any one of these tickets away. And that, and that turns out to be one of those winners, you're gonna get rewarded. We have, here's what we have. If you happen to give away one of the fourth place uh, $100,000 winning tickets, we're gonna get your organization $25,000. Third place, it's gonna be $50,000. Second place, $100,000. And if you happen to give away the, um, if you happen to give away the uh, billion dollar ticket, uh, we're going to give your organization a free winning donation of five million dollars. So, talk about large donations. Talk about opportunities for for many for for many opportunities to uh, to get uh, a significant amount of money for your organization. It's there, and so um, we also have a way for for organization. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with this because I I don't want to take up uh, you know as much time. Normally, this presentation takes me about uh, 30 to 45 minutes, and I'm going as quickly as I can to kind of keep it down to about 20 minutes so I can um, so I can let you get on with the rest of your presentations here. But we have a game that allows student, uh, allows uh, players to earn free entries. Now, a free entry is this. Uh, when, you, when they purchase a ticket, they get a number. Let's say it's one, two, three, four. Along the way, they're going to be able to earn additional free entries. And a free entry is that same ticket number, one, two, three, four, in the in the drawing multiple times sometimes hundreds sometimes thousands of times doesn't cost anything to get a free entry but it does increase the probability that their ticket is going to be drawn and they can get those free entries by by going to our website but mainly what we're trying to do is to get to encourage them to do good deeds like helping your organization volunteering doing things like that uh, also sharing media about what we're doing with the uh, with the with the raffle so they can earn a lot of free entries for just doing good deeds. And that helps your organization in a way that, uh, you know, gives you more volunteers and opportunities that they can work for you and help you to, to pursue your cause. Yeah, also, we're gonna do additional help. Uh, we have a program called Around Robin. Um, every organization that comes to our program has to have a, um, has to have a sponsor. If they don't have a sponsor, they become what we call an orphan. And we have a program that is going to award you as a, as a nonprofit or a charity with additional um, orphans or additional uh, people who are coming into play. And if any of those people um, uh, happen to win one of the large prizes, you're going to get the credit for it and you're going to get those, those uh, rewards that we told you about. Um, uh, we have other programs that are up that uh, increase ticket sales. We, we our VIP program and our influencer program, um, and with those, they also can get into the round robin. But they get two levels, whereas nonprofits and charities get rewarded with four levels. Now, this is just for the first raffle. We plan to do eventually going to do one raffle per month. So the opportunity instead of just three billion dollars, it'll be thirty six billion dollars. Because when you multiply twelve times three, and then we also have, um, well, first of all, the round robin is only open for a limited time, so we we want we want you to get started with this early. But um, 
Um, first of all, let me, go, let me back up and say this. Uh, you're probably saying, well, there's gotta be a cost somewhere. And um, there's not. Um, again, uh, we're doing this gladly at no cost to you. We're not looking to make money from you. We're looking to make money for you. Um, that's, our, that's our goal. That's our passion. That's why we're here. And so this is all free. So, um, so why are we doing this? First of all, we need a little help from you. Um, we want you to spread the word about the raffle, especially in international context. We're in countries where we may not have, uh, where they may not be able to buy tickets. Uh, we can give them away there. Uh, and you can do this through your newsletters, your social media posts, any way that you communicate with your, with your people on your mailing list. Um, we want you to put the information about the raffle on your website. And finally, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being willing to help us with our mission to be able to help charities and natural and, and in natural disasters uh, as we as we go through. So, so why are we so confident that we can make this happen? And I'll go through this very quickly. Um, first of all, we have excellent leadership. We know the money will be there, and we have a plan. Um, our leadership. Uh, you may have heard of the chairman of our board, is Dr. Hans Reinisch. Um, he's over 20 years of a CEO in U Europe, Australia, uh, Caribbean, the United States. Um, he's also the managing director and CEO of EMI Music and Capital Records in Europe and becoming the world's number one entertainment group by acquiring Virgin Records from Richard Branson. And he's got a doctorate degree in finance. Great leader. He, he, he knows many, many people, very influential around the world. Um, this is our board of directors. All this information is online, so I'm not going to go through this with you, um, but just let me say that, that we are very uh, happy to have each one of these people on here. They do a wonderful job in leading our organization. This is our senior management and upper management uh, group. Um, just to show you, we're not a small organization. We have uh, a lot of people who have lots of ability and are experts in their fields. Um, Actually, we work together and we have come up with a great, uh, great way to be able to, to do our program here of raising money for charities, nonprofits, and disaster relief. We, finally, we have a philanthropic board, um, Black Tie Magazine. You've probably heard of that. They do all kinds of fundraising programs around the world. Um, and they feature us on, 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 their, on their website and are very, um, very influential in helping us to spread the word about what we're doing. And they're the ones who decide where the money goes. Okay, so then we have, we know that's our leadership team. We know where the money's gonna come. We have a great um, corporate sponsorship program. Um, if um, you, if you, any of your people have a business that they would like to sponsor, um, uh, there's, there's a website that'll show you what they need to do and what, how it can benefit them. Um, this is where the money's going to come from as far as the ticket sales are concerned. Um, and you can see there that our balance is going to be $3.467 um, billion for disaster relief and charity. And I, I didn't mention this, so in, in our raffle, there is a one in three chance that every ticket is going to win something. So it's, it's not like it is with a lottery where, you, you know, it's a billion to one. Uh, this one, you know, if you have a ticket, there's a one in three chance that that ticket is going to win you some sort of a cash. And that may not be much, but, uh, you know, we're going to have a lot of winners in this program and people feel good, even if they just win a little amount. So, but we do also have the, the large amounts, like I, like I pointed out. Um, this has been over a decade in preparation. And we've already completed this. A few other things that we have left to do. Most of these are already in, in process and it's just a, a matter of days before. And we are, uh, matter of fact, this week is gonna be our, our official soft launch. Our actual launch will be November 15th, but um, we will be uh, uh, selling tickets here uh, very, very shortly. So do your due, due diligence, do a Google search, uh, check out our, our, our YouTube channel. Uh, we have all the information there. We're not trying to hide anything from you. We want you to be well aware of what we're doing uh, uh, and why we're doing it. And um, but if you do your due uh, your due diligence, this is what you're going to find. And again, I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, first of all, here's our legal opinions, um, our press releases, 
the fact that we have a global reach with uh, zero marketing costs. Uh, there's a dashboard for each of you to know exactly where you stand with the organization, who's got your tickets and so forth. Um, we believe and we know that we're going to be a philanthropic game changer. Um, I didn't mention this before, but every 12th raffle, instead of $1 billion, we're going to be giving away $5 billion. If you think $1 billion is going to um, be exciting, can you imagine what it's going to be like when a winner is going to get $5 billion? Haven't told us what second and third place prizes are going to be, but I'm sure they're going to be up there and, and pretty high. Um, and then here you're also going to learn how, how a raffle is different from a lottery. Uh, and we have a communication center that we use. And I just want to get to one more here. So what's next? First of all, do your due diligence. We want you to check us out, make sure that you're comfortable with us. We, you know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, that's our website right there, avazoo.com uh, forward slash nonprofit. When you go there, there's a form. Fill out that form. It's an, it's an application. Um, we're not asking, we don't ask you for credit card information. We just want you, we just don't want to know how do we, we can contact you and some basic information about your organization that is, is available anywhere. Um, we want to see what level that you'll qualify for and um, the number of promotional tickets that you'll get. Um, so if you qualify, you'll immediately be assist, assisted by one of our staff in getting started, helping you to put, to, you put a way to use those, those free tickets that we're going to be giving you to um, first of all, raise some immediate money and then down the road, get some bigger money from the, from the, uh, um, from the tickets that are winners. Now, please note, even though we've allocated millions of promotional tickets, they're not unlimited. Uh, the nonprofit program will end when the last ticket is allocated. Uh, so don't delay. Yeah, we want you to sign up at, right away. Uh, uh, as, as soon as you get off the, um, the, the webinar, go to our site, sign up, let's get the ball rolling. Um, now, I do have uh, every, I do every Thursday at two o'clock New York time. I, I, I'm not going to tell you what time it is by where you are, because I know we have people from all over the world. Uh, but if you look at two o'clock your time, I mean, New York time, um, you can you can see I'll, I'll do this presentation. So if you'd like to get on with me and um, uh, where I can uh, take a little bit more time and do the presentation. Um, we'd love to have you join us and let other charities know because we're interested in helping everybody. We, you know, we don't have, we do have a charity that we use, but by the same token, we're, we have, uh, our, our goal is to help as many charities as we possibly can. So, um, and if you are interested in our other calls, like our VIP program, and I think Scott's going to mention something about that. Um, and um, that's that's about everything that I have, um, and I'd like to say thank you, and um, appreciate you. Oops, let me go back. Uh, stop sharing. Thank you, thank you very much, Jim. Um, I hope I, I didn't go too long. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. That's uh, I think this is a uh, is a great opportunity for fundraising. Most people here are looking for uh, funds. So I think this is a very, very innovative uh, opportunity. So, uh, so we'd like to ask everybody to go to that site, avazoo.com, and uh, grab your ticket. So if we have questions, then we can take uh, three or four questions, and then um, we'll move to the next uh, session. I believe uh, people have questions. Anybody with a question uh, for Jim, please? Please go, raise your hand and... Uh, All right, uh, Isaac Yusuf has a question, um, uh, and uh, Truman. Uh, Isaac, go fast, please. Nick, please uh, release uh, Isaac's microphone to ask the question. Isaac, please go fast. I'm, I'm looking in the chat too, John. I'm, I'm looking to see if I see anything. I Oh yeah. Okay. Fine. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, it's. Uh, I'm very happy. I'm right now uh, at Mogadishu, Somalia, watching the, the the great session here. I really appreciate uh, the kind of presentations given here. And uh, my question is all about: Will you be able to share with us the presentation slides, please? Uh, 
through our emails that we registered with. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I it's hard. It's I can't I can't send it through email because it's too big. Um, are are you on? Um, I can send it through Skype if you're on Skype. Um, we can uh, we can send it through Skype. Uh, I will I will one way or another I will get it to John and then John maybe you can get it we'll out. Share to with the, other participants. Yes, you can we'll you can get it you can get it out. Um, We'll um, I apologize for the fact that it is a little bit large and it's hard to send an email. I tried to send it to John this morning and uh, I wouldn't go, but okay. um, but we'll we'll get we'll get you one for sure. All right. Okay, uh, and by the way, we can, we can, uh, excuse me, we can have uh, in a Google Drive uh, as a link. I think that could be easiest way as a drive. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Hello, I'm saying uh, we can you can share with us through Google Drive as a link, and then you can put there in a folder through Google Drive. Okay. All right. Yeah, Jim. I, I, if you don't know about that, I can I can explain to you about that. I've I've used Google Drive before. Okay. 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 Thank All right. You. No question. We have another question from uh, Veronica Costa. Please go. Uh, make uh, Nick release uh, Veronica Costa. Uh, Pronoti Veronica Costa. <laughs> Please raise your question. I'm not, I'm not hearing anything. Veronica? Veronica, do you need to unmute yeah, yourself? Yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. I forgot to un uh, unmute myself. Uh, thank you for all of you for arranging such a nice event for us so that we can draw the attention of you. Uh, my question to Jim was that uh, even, uh, like I, I am working with uh, organization World Vision Bangladesh, but out of that in my surrounding community, uh, there are many non-profitable organization uh, who need uh, actually fund and some of them uh, really they're small uh, initiatives they have working for the community but in our uh, present context due to covid uh, in bangladesh the uh, northern west of bangladesh the coastal region like uh Shakira, you know the place here uh, rapidly uh, child marriage increased uh, in a huge uh, amount but, and we are really struggling to work with that. But always we got the question from the parents, from the victims that uh, you want to uh, st uh, stop child marriage in this area. But uh, as we are the poor people, as we are the uh, disaster infected people of the city coastal area, we don't have enough resources or stability or strength to, um, to follow up our girls up to 18 years or to continue their study up to 18 years. So because of the poverty, most of the child marriages are happening in this area. But in Bangladesh, we don't have any safety net programs from government to uh, support those families uh, to, so that they can uh, continue the study of those girl child. So if we want to uh, actually uh, want some donations and write some context note for uh, stopping child marriage, as I am uh, also working with social, uh, working as a social inclusion specialist, that we want some uh, uh, help from you that so that we can uh, uh, help those family with the victims of uh, child marriage so that they can uh, uh, stop that and can be an asset of the country. So what should be the procedure uh, or what should be the documentations to write those kinds of concept notes? Well, okay, we, uh, uh, the, first, the first thing to do is to get in our system um, and that would be to fill out the, uh, fill out the, um, the application and, and the website, the uh, avazoo.com forward slash nonprofit and um, fill out that application, get into our system. Even if you don't qualify for the free tickets, you can, we will have a process and that's, we're in the process right now of putting that, uh, putting the finishing touches on that of what, what the application process is going to be for nonprofits to, to request funds for their individual projects. Um, and how it will work is that application will go to our philanthropy board. And the philanthropy board is made up of uh, people who are, 
uh, very familiar with nonprofits and also business people who know how to disperse money. Um, it's a very diverse board, uh, very well represented, and they will look at every, uh, every application that we get and uh, make determinations on where the money's gonna be, um, where the money's gonna be allocated. But everything that you've told me that you're trying to do are the types of things that we want to help. So I would say there would be a good chance that we'd be able to help you in some way financially with, um, with, the, uh, with, with your request. So does that answer your question? Okay, I think we've, I think we've lost her. Thank you, thank you very much. Let's take uh, two more very fast. Loku Severino, please. Uh, Rock, uh, Loku Severino, please uh, ask your question to Jim. Loku? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, make, it, make it short. Okay, my question, uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Loku Severino from South Sudan. Uh, my question is, uh, now, for example, if, if I have not yet uh, established my own NGO or national NGO to, to how shall I get uh, the funds to, to get uh, uh, my NGO running, especially in South Sudan here, there are so many things that uh, I need to uh, intervene on, like in education. Education is badly off. So if I can form my NGO and I want to run the education project, and how can I get supported in terms of getting funds from me? Yeah, that's my simple question. Well, again, again um, the, the main thing is to go to our website and fill out the application. Um, get into our system so we know who you are, what you're doing, and so forth. Once we know that, and, the, and then the, when the system is in place and we have the money that we can disperse, because this money is not going to be available quite yet. It's going to be a little bit of time uh, because we, we, we have to go through the process of selling our tickets, uh, raising the money for the, uh, for the, for the drawing. And once, but once the drawing is done, that money is going to be available. And those of us, those people who are in the system will have an opportunity uh, it, you'll be ahead of the game because everybody else is, you know, is going to have to go through the through the process of getting, um, you know, letting us know who they are, what they're doing, and so forth. But we will already be able to to know who you are and what you're doing, and you'll have, you know, be able to be in in a good standing to be able to gain uh, some access to some of some of the money that's going to be coming in. And you may be big enough to be able to get some free tickets, which would be even better for you. I didn't. I didn't mention. I, I didn't. Did not mention the cost of the tickets. Um, and let me just mention those real quickly. We wanted to make this affordable for everybody. Um, so our the, the, we our our tickets that you will be receiving are actually twenty dollars tickets. So some of our tickets are twenty dollars. Uh, some are fifty dollars, and most of them are a hundred dollars. And we find that most most people will, will be buying the one hundred dollars tickets. But we didn't want to leave anybody out. So we thought at twenty dollars, uh, even if it's something that has to be, you know, they don't, they can't get it very quickly, uh, they could save up to to get the uh, the twenty dollar ticket, so that they can have that opportunity to win one of the big prizes. Right. Uh, thank okay, you very thank much. You. Let's take the last one from somewhere, Mugale, please, um, and then um, we'll be done with that session. Samuel Mugale, please, please. Samuel, okay, if Samuel is not ready, then uh, let's have put a uh, joke. I can see your hand is up. Oh, Mugale is on. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I, I couldn't unmute myself, but basically I wanted to know uh, what is the process of uh, getting the, the funding from the time you apply and until the fund is rewarded? Uh, what, what, what is the, the time frame? Are you asking what the, what is the process for us to get money to you? The time frame. The time, okay. the time frame from, from the time I, I submit the application form until it's it, it, it awarded to me. Um, it's pretty quick. Once 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 you are once you submit the application and get approved by our philanthropy board, um, we will immediately. Um, uh, get the tickets to you, 
and uh, work with you in helping you to distribute those to your people and to uh, use them in your fundraising efforts. Okay. Okay. Um, John, let me just enter and say this. If, uh, if it would be helpful, uh, if you want to get the word out, um, I would be willing to do another, um, another session uh, where, where people could ask questions and um, we, you know, we could, we could, um, you know, just do a, a regular chat. Um, if, if that would be helpful, uh, if, if they need, if, if, uh, especially if they're after the, if, well, let me say this, they should first go and register. And then if they, we can get them on, we can get online and we can do a, a, a separate session and, um, and answer, try to answer any questions that they may have at that point. No problem, Jim. Uh, we will do another session in November and uh, we'll invite you in uh, good time to uh, make another presentation. But most importantly, I think uh, we're going to appeal to people to you know, pass the word and visit your site and uh, sign in, especially for the uh, for the free tickets. Yes. If you have uh, any closing remarks, I think you can do at this stage, or and then uh, we move to the next session. I thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm sure lots of uh, nonprofits can really benefit from uh, uh, the opportunity provided by Abazu. Thank you. Thank you. It was my privilege to be here. Thank you, Scott. Do you have something to add? Um. Well, I do, but I don't want to take up all of your meeting um i mean ju just quickly i won't go into details but obviously there are other ways that you can get involved with abazu as well as the non-profit side um we have obviously individuals um that can buy a ticket so if they're in a position to have the money obviously they can buy either a 20 dollar a 50 dollar or the vip 100 dollar ticket the only difference between these, the, those tickets are that they have sl slightly different benefits. Obviously, the higher the ticket, the more benefits. Uh, but I don't, won't go into details on that. But there's also two other levels, which are for a small groups, which we call a syndicate level, where if they've got between 10 and 25 people, whether it's friends and family or a small company or a sports team or something, they can form a syndicate and that ticket would be $1,500. Um, the benefits of that is the every, every member that joins also gets three free tickets. So they get the ticket, which is the one number. Remember, there's only one number, but they also get three free tickets for every person that's, that's a part of the syndicate. And then for a bigger company, they have a corporate level at level five, which is two thousand five hundred dollars. Um, now, corporates can either use that as an incentive for staff. If it's a really large company, they might want to incentivize staff, especially like maybe sales teams. If they reach a certain sales level, they get a ticket or something like that. So they can use that um, on a corporate level. For the corporate level, it should be 25 to 250. So 25 is the minimum, 250 is the maximum. And then we're also looking for any retail outlets. If there's retail outlets with uh, at least five uh, outlets, or, uh, or uh, funding, I think it's $100,000 in two weeks, they can apply to become a retailer and sell the tickets on our behalf, and they would receive 5% commission to do Wonderful. with whatever they want to. So that's basically you know, all I wanted to. Oh, oh, and I think Jim mentioned the sponsorship as well. If you're like a huge company like Microsoft or something, you might want to get involved at that level and actually sponsor our company. And there's a huge amount of benefits in terms of advertising and uh, you know because we're going to be having tv and celebrities will be drawing the tickets so this is not going to be something small once it goes it's going to be huge it's going to be worldwide television etc so yeah that's all i want to say really <laughs> thank you thank you awesome we have uh, over 125 people here i'm sure they'll pass the word visit the site of azu.com for more information thank you very much uh, scott and jim and uh, let's keep in touch Okay. All yep. right. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much you for me. inviting us. All right. Bye bye. Thank you for inviting us. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll keep in touch for the next uh, session in November or December. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think at this stage, uh, 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 I would like to invite uh, Victorine to quickly introduce Strategia and Rachel, and then we'll go to Evelyn, who will give us a session on uh, fundraising tips during um, uh, these COVID uh, challenges. Thank you. I think, Victorine, you can go first, uh, three minutes each, and then we move to the next yeah. session. 
Thank you, John. Uh, my apologies. My I'm having some few technical issues, so you can't see me. But I'll try and make this as brief as possible. I'm going just going to share my screen now. Um, so I'm sure you've already seen a few in the adverts about Strategia Netherlands. We are the sponsors of this event, and we wanted to take a few few minutes of your time just to tell you a bit about our offerings. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Right, so Strategic Netherlands, we are an international organization based in the Netherlands, and we mostly do training, capacity training and development work for, in the humanitarian um, field. We have had over 10 years experience and we have trained different people within the NGO and humanitarian um, field per se. Um, we have worked with a number of different companies, just I don't know if you can see at the bottom, we've worked with um, USAID, the UN, um, the Ministry of Health in Kenya, and uh, we, have, we pride ourselves in being able to offer training, um, occupational training and additional training to professionals within the NGO, NGO community or humanitarian work. Um, we have a number of different courses on offer. Uh, there are quite a lot, 21 exciting humanitarian development courses, but I'd like to mention just a few of our most popular ones and that could be in line with the theme of today. So we have postgraduate diploma in grant management, uh, monitoring and evaluation, water sanitization and hygiene, project management. Um, in terms of diplomas, we have public health, food security, conflict management, disaster management. Um, we also have fundraising and proposal writing, which is, I think, most of what this, this webinar is about. And the purpose of these courses ideally is to offer training, so additional training. So let's say, for example, you're a project manager for a, a project that's going on, whether it's fundraising and you want to be able to learn a bit more about grants management. How do you monitor the money that comes in once you've gotten the funding from these different different um donors out there. So um, we do a bit of this. If you want to find out a bit more about the courses we have, there's a website there, strategianetherlands.eu, and you're able to look at the different, different courses on offer. Now, um, our courses are mostly delivered through the online channel. So a bit of, of what we're doing today in terms of webinars, and they're classified into three, three main things. So we have certificate courses, which go for three months at a cost of 500 euros. We have diploma courses that go for six months at a cost of 800 euros. And then we have postgraduate diplomas that tend to take a year at the cost of 1,200 euros. As I said, it's, it's, it's the e-learning online platform. And um, the most important thing I think that differentiates, differentiates sorry, us from most is it's this, this self-paced um, aspect where you're able to learn at your own pace, kind of um, plan your own working hours, assignments, know when they're due and then do them. Um, we also do a lot of inter because most people when they hear online courses, they don't they, they assume that it's just you sit in, in, in your house somewhere and you do it yourself. We have a lot of interactivity in ours where we have Zoom sessions, um, webinars similar to this, where we bring in different experts within the fields of the courses that are being talked about to just kind of discuss and, and, and exchange ideas on how um, we can kind of enhance this learning process. Um, we have usually have two intakes in a month. So the first of every month and the 15th of every month. And um, if you're interested in registering for this, again, the email address is there down, um, on your screen. For the lucky participants joining us today, um, we have a special 20% off kind of offer on all our courses. Um, all, you, all you'd have to do is just send an email to the email address, this one, and just quote webinar promo. Um, this will run for the most of this, the rest of this month, that is, so for the next week. So anytime within this time, if you just reach out to us and use this co code or just inform us that you are at the webinar and you want to get this special offer, we'll be able to facilitate that. I'm sorry you couldn't see my face because of my technical <laughs> difficulties, but uh, my name is Victorine. I am the training manager at Strategia Netherlands. And if you'd like to find out more, you can just drop us an email or visit our website for more information. Um, so yeah, at this point, I hope that was clear. Um, if you have any questions, you can just drop them in the chat section below. I'm trying not to, to hold it too much of the session. Um, and I guess at this point, I'd like to introduce Rachel, who can talk a bit about um, Capacity, Capacity Africa. Thank you so much. I was thinking uh, we go straight to Evelyn, then uh, Rachel can come in um, after Evelyn. So we don't do, uh, uh, you know, um, so let's let's have Evelyn uh, do her session right now. Then Rachel will come immediately after Evelyn, please. So we have uh, we you know yes, uh, Evelyn. Um, um, I've known Evelyn for about twenty five years. 
uh, working with the development organizations in Kenya. Uh, she's the head of uh, Stop TB program in Kenya and, uh, you know, an experienced hands-on fundraiser. Uh, so she's going to give us some tips on uh, how to uh, navigate fundraising during COVID and also part of our experiences uh, as a fundraiser in Africa. Welcome, Evelyn, and uh, thank you very much for honoring this invitation. I'm having I want we can't hear you. Evelyn, we've lost her. Um, okay, I think we've lost her. Then uh, Rachel, please come in and uh, tell us about uh, our partner Capacity Africa. As um, we are trying to locate uh, Evelyn, I think there's a network problem uh, from Nairobi. Rachel? Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Rachel. I'm a training manager at Capacity Africa Group. I have a presentation for us today about Capacity Africa. Uh, let me just share my screen. Thank you. Um, so Capacity Africa is a leading uh, development and humanitarian uh, provider in Africa. Our headquarters are in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, our mission is to make development and humanitarian work more effective. And we can achieve this through developing and implementing high quality consultancy projects, uh, developing, uh, delivering innovating capacity building solutions. And we work with UN, the government, non-organizational uh, NGOs and private individuals in Africa. And we have partners all over the, uh, Africa. For example, we have a Kenya, we have in South Africa, Uganda, Somalia, Tanzania, Rwanda, South Africa, and many more. Uh, we have online courses, uh, which are classified under business courses, development courses, and humanitarian courses, and uh, a certificate level where they go for $500 at a period of three months. We have the diploma level going for $800 for a period of six months and postgraduate diploma going for $1,200 for a period of uh, 12 months. Uh, the benefits of doing online courses uh, is, first of all, the while the dynamics has changed, we got COVID-19 and everyone was not prepared for it. So online uh, courses have enabled people to be able to study from everywhere. And, and this uh, is because we have uh, training materials that are internationally prepared. We have the best world practices in management and leadership. We have uh, training materials that have been researched on and have a global best practice. There is also real-time case studies where you're able to look at a solution uh, to a problem uh, in a real-life scenario. And then this comprehensive course material. We also have uh, networking opportunities where you're able to interact with professional peers as you will see as you do the online courses. Uh, the, some of the online courses we offer are uh, managing development projects and organizations. We have public health. We have strategic, uh, strategic uh, planning and management. We have uh, conflict management courses. We have leadership and management courses. We have human resource. We have community development courses. We have water sanitation and hygiene courses. And if you'd like to find out more information about this, you can uh, visit our website. It's down there for capacityafrica.com. And our courses, course intakes are normally uh, the first of every month. We have an intake going on uh, in November. And participants who are here with us today, you have a 20% discount. And it's running for a period of one week. And in order to register, we have our uh, 
uh, in information right there, the, the email address is info at capacityafrica.com. Um, thank you so much, and we hope you will join our Capacity Africa group. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Is uh, thank you very much, Evelyn. Uh, Evelyn, if you cannot reach uh, Evelyn, then I think we ask uh, Stephen Mushami to come in and uh, do his session on um, the technical aspects of uh, uh, proposal design and and uh, you know developing a proposal for the purpose of a fundraising. Uh, first, let me confirm if we can reach Evelyn. Evelyn, are you available? We lost her. Huh? Um, okay, uh, Steve Mushami, then I think this is your opportunity to uh, take us through the session on fundraising. Uh, like we've always done, we like to give value. It's not just enough tips, uh, giving tips. We also give you technical skills on how to design and write a proposal. And uh, we invite uh, Steve Mushami, he's been very faithful to us for many years. So thank you very much, Steve, uh, Steve and uh, take the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, so I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Steven Muchami, and uh, thank you, uh, John, for introducing me. And um, uh, just to be able to go through this session and just look at um, what are some of the fundraising tips uh, that we can actually be able to utilize during uh, COVID-19 crisis. And um, that's what we are going to be able to go through. And um, um, again, also uh, just to say that um, uh, it's very, very good to um, have you all participants that have been able to gather uh, for today's session as we look at this uh, critical topic uh, that we have for today. Uh, so um, I think I also have some challenge on my video, but I'm sure you can pretty see my profile photo there. Um, so, so, so that's that's. That's how I look like, or close to that. So, uh, so you can basically just uh, uh, be able to follow with me as we as we go through this discussion and um, basically look at um, uh, some of the agenda items uh, that we actually want to be able to discuss and um, be able to ensure that um, uh, we're able to look at them. So, uh, so we'll be looking at um, concepts that um, basically used a lot of the times in proposal writing and fundraising. And um, what I will do, I'll just make sure that I can define them for you uh, so that you find um, a bit of ease uh, in case you have to be able to use uh, some of those concepts. Um, uh, it becomes very easy for you to understand how we are able to use them. And um, after I've been able to do that, I'll also uh, be looking at um, the key proposal components um, um, uh, in a logical sequence, just to take you through um, the first uh, component or the first chapter of the proposal all the way to the last component or last chapter of the proposal. And this uh, should actually make your work very easy. Uh, should it make it um, very hard for you to uh, be able to write up proposals? I think it should be very, very easy for you uh, to be able to uh, put down a proposal as fast as possible and ensure that um, you meet the threshold of each of the components that we normally um, have to deal with. Uh, so that's something that um, uh, we're going to be able to look at. And then of course, uh, we'll be able to look at um, understanding why some proposals don't get funded. Um, that's something that um, I will also uh, be wanting to be able to look at. Uh, and then again, also uh, we'll be looking at um, understanding the fundraising environment so that we can know exactly what happens uh, when it comes to the fundraising uh, environment. Uh, then again, also something else that we're going to be able to look at uh, is just basically look at um, what are some of the steps in project planning and design, uh, which is also very, very critical that uh, We've lost Steve. Steve. Oh. 
Oh, problem with network. We've lost Steve. Uh, Evelyn, are you ready? We've lost Steve. I don't know what's happening today. Evelyn, are you ready? Evelyn, are you ready? Are you, we've lost Steve. I don't know what's happening. God. I, Evelyn, are you ready to go? We can't hear you. Nick, can you try to reach uh, Steve on the phone? Evelyn, can you hear me? Nick? Evelyn, can you hear me? Please proceed, uh, proceed. We can't hear you. I think we have to log out and come back. I, we've lost our audio for Zoom. I don't know. Uh, we can hear you clearly. I think Evelyn's um, audio is. But even now, uh, Steve has, has gone off. I don't know what's happening. Uh, is Nick there? Can Nick call uh, Evelyn and, uh, and find out what's happening? We can't, we can't hear what she's saying. We can't. what's happening and they're not at the same place but uh, we've lost them both nick uh, victorine can 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 we sign off and then come in again yes let, uh, let's try that i think let's do that because it's not possible that uh two people have lost a uh, network at the same time Let's all sign off and then come in again. Uh, you know. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, what's the problem, Nick? Mushami is joining. Okay. Yes, he's experiencing a technical problem, but he's joining in a few minutes. All right. So, okay. don't, don't, don't sign off. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. Let's let be a little patient. Okay. So in the meantime, as we wait, so sorry for the technical, I'd like to invite Beatrice to talk a little bit. Oh, sure. Beatrice. Yeah, Beatrice can come in and tell us about uh, the delivery of the courses as we um, welcome to uh, uh, Mushami to continue with the session on how to design uh, uh, fundraising proposals. Beatrice, please. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining us from. My name is Beatrice from Capacity Africa Group. Uh, so, Victorine and uh, Rachel have talked about the programs that we have. And uh, the question that uh, now lingers on uh, people's mind is, uh, what next? So, once you develop an interest in any of our courses, and you satisfactorily meet all the requirements of the program as discussed by Victorine and uh, Rachel, mm -hmm. you receive an acceptance letter. You then proceed to pay the fee. After the fee payment, the student is enrolled into a virtual learning program. 
in that virtual learning program, you are, you'll be given admission number, you'll be registered and placed on a learning platform. This is the point of contact between a learner and the program instructor. After which you'll undergo an orientation as a student, as a new student, whereby you'll be taken through the expectations of the course. You'll also be able to uh, get your supervisors uh, where you'll also be taught or uh, be instructed on how to tackle the assignment. And then the course will begin from there. Victorine talked about the learning methodology, which uh, she mentioned that uh, learning is self-paced. And one is required to spend approximately five to six hours of study time weekly on your course study. But as a student, you decide how much time you want to put in your study. This is because although it is self-paced, deadlines for assignment completion are set and the deadlines have to be adhered to. Just like Rachel mentioned earlier, the platform has all the course materials. We have all the resources in the platform, such as videos, research papers, journals to aid the student in his or her study. Also note that these one-on-one -on -one virtual interactive sessions. This normally comes in where the student gets to interact with the lecturers either through monthly Zoom classes, workshops which are organized and uh, expert talks. These interactive sessions are normally scheduled in advance that is, uh, students are informed beforehand so that you can be able to plan for your Zoom classes or plan to, to attend a workshop, an, an online workshop. After you complete your coursework, you sit your, you'll sit your exam, whereby after that you'll be eligible to graduate and get your certificate. From there, you can then advance to the next level that could be a diploma or a postgraduate diploma, depending on the level where you began in. So for more information, just as discussed by Victorine and uh, Rachel, you can get us on our website. Also, uh, you can also get us, uh, you can also get uh, this presentation on YouTube. And I would ask everyone who is present here to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also like and share the information. I believe that the information that is uh, shared in this platform is going to benefit others too. Thank you so much, Mr. Kariga. Back to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice. Um, uh, thank you very much. That's very important uh, on how the courses are delivered. Um, Evelyn says um, she needs to be unmuted. Nick, please unmute uh, Evelyn. So she can go first before uh, Muchami, as we had already uh, planned. Please unmute Evelyn, she's ready. Thank you, thank you, Beatrice. Evelyn? Okay, please go, Evelyn. I'm sorry about that. Hello, Evelyn. Nick is um okay. We can't hear. You. We can't hear you. We can see you talking, but we can't hear you. Oh no. Nick is uh, is um Steve ready? Thank you, Steven, Jim. Steven, 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 you can proceed. Yes, yes, Thank I am. You, Jim, and have uh, a good night. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, apologies for that. I uh, just, uh, um, internet slowdown. I think I was just uh, um, I'm, I'm thrown out of the meeting, uh, but at least I'm, I'm back now. 
And uh, I was at this point where I was trying to just highlight um, some of the things that I would just want us to be able to understand uh, in regards to this session. Uh, so <clears throat> what are some of the things that we actually need to be able to uh, achieve at the end of the session? And so I was point number four, I was talking about gaining an understanding of the fundraising environment and also discussing some of the critical steps in project planning and design. And um, another thing is we are also going to have a feedback session uh, at the end of my presentation so that we can be able to pick up on your questions and comments um, um, at the end of the session. So, uh, so as I go through um, um, what we have for today, uh, please um, uh, feel free to uh, just uh, uh, take some notes and, uh, uh, and also uh, um, put down some questions that you may want to be able to ask and I can be able to um, answer to those questions and also uh, get your comments about the session um, at the end of my presentation. So let's just look at the first um, um, uh, component that we want to be able to look at, uh, which we said um, is good to familiarize with some concepts uh, that are very, very critical when it comes to proposal writing and fundraising. And um, uh, sometimes we find a lot of um, 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 proposal writers are really not very, very clear on how we should be able to use some of these concepts. And so what I'm trying to do is to make them um, um, as, um, as, as simplified as possible uh, so that you can easily be able to use them and you don't find um, um, areas where in your proposal writing process, uh, you cannot be able to articulate what is expected uh, when some of these um, um, concepts are mentioned. So, so I think that's what we, and I just want to be able to do uh, to make sure that you are very, very uh, comfortable in using some of these concepts. Uh, so, so the first thing is, um, it is always good to make sure that we understand uh, what is a project because a couple of times when we uh, don't get an opportunity to understand uh, what is a project, um, then sometimes we are not even able to make um, um, a proposal about a project. And so it's always good to know that um, whenever we talk about a project, we are talking about a temporary entity uh, that is basically established to make sure that we can deliver uh, specific and often tangible outputs uh, in line with predefined time, cost, and quality constraints. And we know that um, uh, every time we are looking at a project, then the issue of time the issue of the budget or cost and the issue of quality really, really becomes uh, very, very critical for any project that you want to be able to um, make a proposal for. So, so you, you conceptualize your project. It is always good to be able to think about um, how long is that um, uh, project going to take? Uh, what will be the cost or what will be the budget uh, for, for that particular project? And also, what are some of the quality constraints that you need to uh, make sure that um, you are able to uh, understand in regards to a project. Uh, then secondly, um, another thing that also becomes very, very important uh, to also consider uh, is an activity uh, because um, a project is in, um, um, encompasses certain activities that must be taken. And sometimes uh, we get a lot of confusion uh, between uh, what is an activity and what is an objective. And it's always good to make sure that we have this clear understanding um, basically about um, uh, what is an activity. And um, anytime we talk about um, an activity, basically means that um, uh, we are considering any action that is undertaken by the project or the organization uh, to make sure that we can be able to achieve the set objectives. And this is also what we are able to refer to as inputs. And um, uh, it's something that's very, very uh, critical to make sure that we are able to understand. Uh, then again, we also come across um, the, the, the concept of assumption. And um, um, I'm sure a lot of uh, proposal writers, you'll always tell, um, yeah, you'll always find this um, issue of assumption, uh, something that you have to discuss in your proposal, be it in the logical framework or be it uh, in a donor who really wants you to be very, very clear about the assumptions that you're making regarding your project. And so what's an assumption? Assumption is simply um, a predicted external factor. So it means it is something that you know um, um, is expected to happen and um, of which uh, uh, if it fails to occur, may actually uh, negatively impact a project. In fact, uh, more precisely, uh, we say that um, in case your assumptions uh, fail or, or don't happen, then uh, we are going to automatically uh, convert 
uh, into having a risk in the project. And so most of the times assumptions and risks are always stated together. And um, it is why it's also good just to make sure that we are clear about our risk. Uh, so we don't find ourselves, you know, um, um, in some of the sessions that we have had, uh, uh, even come across uh, some of the development and humanitarian staff, uh, but sometimes because uh, they find in a logical framework that we state risks and assumptions uh, in the same uh, column. So most of the times always, um, they will always think that assumptions and risks are similar, but these are two different um, uh, concepts altogether. Uh, when we talk about a risk, we are talking about a possible external factor uh, that could actually be able to come in and negatively um, affect your project. And that's why uh, we're able to talk about a risk. So, so it's always good to make sure that we are very, very clear about that. Then again, also the issue of beneficiary comes in uh, where uh, you're putting down a proposal and um, um, some of the uh, proposal requirements that you're expected to meet is to be able to define who are the beneficiaries of your project. And um, I think it's good to make sure that we note uh, that whenever we talk about the beneficiary uh, or beneficiaries, we are simply referring to the direct participants or direct recipients uh, of funding or program support and um, uh, basically a group or individual that will be directly impacted and benefit from the project or benefit by the project. And this is the group that we we'll actually be looking at. So you look at your project, see um, um, are there are groups of people who will directly be impacted, are there individuals who will be directly impacted, and um, are they also going to be able to benefit from the project in one way or the other? So, so making sure that we are very, very clear about that. Then, of course, we always come across a budget. And um, a lot of the times um, I found um, um, uh, sometimes when we are writing a proposal, we actually uh, don't understand the importance of the budget. But I will be highlighting more about the budget uh, later on. And this is a document that basically specifies how the money uh, will actually be allocated uh, so that we can implement activities uh, that are actually described in the proposal. Uh, in other words, we say uh, a budget simply <laughs> is a description of the project uh, in terms of figures and numbers. And um, that's basically uh, what happens with the budget uh, is basically something that um, uh, we need to make sure that um, uh, we are actually able to um, um, uh, be clear about. Uh, then again, also the other thing is the gun chart. And um, uh, when you think about the gun chart, uh, the gun chart basically uh, summarizes the schedule uh, or summarizes the timeline of the project um, um, activities proposed. And um, the gun chart is actually similar to a work plan, uh, is actually similar to a timetable, and is actually similar to a schedule. And um, um, it's always good to make sure that we can work with it. Um, I've come across sometimes people um, are saying they don't understand this whole concept of the Gantt chart, especially for first time uh, proposal writers, uh, but it's always good to know that um, uh, it's simply a chart that basically uh, gives a visual visualization about the schedule or the timeline of the project and the activities uh, that have been proposed for that particular project. And that basically um, is what the Gantt chart um, uh, simply does. Now, again, also, uh, the other thing that we also need to make sure that we are clear about uh, is regarding the indicators. Uh, so it's also good to make sure that we have a good understanding of the indicators. And um, these are things that um, uh, in one way or the other, we might be required to um, interrelate with uh, when it comes to looking at some of these projects. And um, the indicator is simply the measure of the results that we are going to be able to uh, look at and the, these measures will basically be able to prove uh, the success of the project. And that's why um, donors are interested in indicators because how do you tell that this particular project in which uh, you submitted a proposal uh, has been able to make progress? So we need to be able to showcase our indicators and it's very, very important uh, that we have a very good understanding of the indicator. Um, uh, and then again, also something else that we can also come across, uh, we can also come across something called the letter of inquiry, the proposal writing process. And um, when you talk about the letter of inquiry, uh, it's always a short letter uh, that basically is sent to a prospective donor uh, to make sure that we are able to determine the donor's interest in evaluating uh, 
uh, a full grant uh, proposal. So, so it's very, very um, uh, important to make sure that um, we are able to uh, send letters of inquiries to some of our prospective donors uh, anytime we want to make sure that um, they have uh, an interest in evaluating our full grant proposal. Uh, then again, also, uh, the other one is um, the concept note. And, um, um, you know, uh, all the times we always talk about proposal and concept notes, and there are also people who uh, probably think a proposal is the same to the concept note. I think it's important that we understand that, um, uh, of course, there's a difference because the concept note is the shortest expression of a project idea uh, that is normally given on paper uh, to a donor and is generally used in the first instance uh, when you're proposing a project to a donor. So most of the times you find in ideal situations, uh, when you send a concept note, um, later on, uh, you may be asked by the donor to be able to send a, a, a full proposal. Uh, this happens a lot uh, with different donors, um, uh, USAID, uh, DFID, and um, all these big donors uh, will always have that kind of um, um, a receipt of a concept note. And then uh, later on, you can be able to follow through uh, with a full proposal. So it's good to make sure uh, that we make sure that our concept notes are as brief as expected. Uh, then again, also, we have the logical framework. And um, logical framework, why we include it um, in a proposal sometimes uh, is to make sure that um, we have a management tool uh, for ensuring that we have effective planning and um, implementation of development projects, um, also um, uh, ensuring that the framework um, uh, is actually clear, concise, and systematic information um, about a project. So, so, so it's a very uh, effective management tool uh, for ensuring that we have effective planning and implementation of development projects, and then again, also, we have what you call a theory of change, uh, which basically uh, determines um, uh, the methodology that basically defines long-term goals, and then also maps uh, backward uh, so that we can be able to identify uh, the necessary uh, preconditions that um, we actually require. So, so that's uh, what um, we deal with uh, when you talk about the theory of change. Uh, then, of course, we have monitoring and evaluation, which is a critical component of most proposal, um, where um, um, we basically need to be able to document, um, 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 where we basically need to be able to, uh, to document um, 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 uh, the approach that we'll, uh, we are actually going to be able to measure and access um, and assess the success and the performance of projects, programs, or the entire uh, organization. So it's always good to make sure that we can be able to familiarize with some of those concepts uh, that we normally uh, use in proposal writing and fundraising process. And um, it is always critical that we are able to understand that. Now, having said that, um, it's also good for us to be able to understand um, uh, what are some of the uh, critical components um, um, uh, in a proposal, and uh, we'll be able to look at them in a logical sequence. That is how you are expected to be able to write them uh, from the beginning to the end. Remember, uh, what we're presenting here is basically the common component. Um, it doesn't rule out that um, sometimes you will have a call of proposal and has, um, and, um, has a a, a, a differently worded component from what we have um, uh, we have been able to uh, uh, we have been able to word here. Uh, so so you might be able to come through situations where um, some of these components, the way we are wording them here in this particular presentation, uh, you might find them that they are different from what they will be uh, worded in different uh, calls for proposal. And then again, also you might get some inclusions of new. Uh, concepts that um, sometimes you might be able to come through, uh, but either way, uh, that should not um, take you away from the focus that um, a proposal will have uh, this kind of uh, logical uh, sequence as, as much as possible. So, so it's always good uh, to make sure that we can be able to pay attention uh, to some of those components. So, uh, so what we do, we start with um, the very, very first, um, um, about the cover note. Uh, um, 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 the cover page and uh, 
Uh, most of you, I'm sure you, uh, for some of you who have been able to uh, work with the cover page, uh, one of the things that you have also been able to realize uh, is that it is always important to make sure uh, that we are able to provide um, um, a great first impression uh, to the donor uh, through the cover page, uh, because um, as they always say, uh, uh, sometimes they, um, a book can be judged by its cover, and um, it is always good to make sure that uh, uh, whatever you put in the cover page is, is very, very um, um, clear and, and create a first impression to the donor. Uh, so, so normally uh, the details that we include here uh, is probably uh, the name of our organization that is applying for uh, for funding, and also the logo is always good also to make sure uh, that um, you are able also to have your brand on the cover note. And again, also uh, is important to make sure that uh, uh, we're able to put the project title uh, so that it's very very clear uh, what the funding is for. Uh, then again, also, you can go ahead and also be able to in, include the date and also the contact information and also the name of the donor uh, for which you are applying funds from. So, so it's always good to make sure uh, that we can be able to make some of those um, uh, considerations as, um, as much as possible. Now, before you also proceed uh, to development of activities, and it is always important also to be clear uh, of the project strategy. And so it's also good uh, to make sure that um, we are always clear uh, of the project um, uh, strategy uh, as much as possible. And um, that's something that um, you, we, we need also to make sure that um, we are able to do. Uh, then again, also, uh, it is also good to make sure that uh, you have an exec executive summary um, and also uh, ensure that um, you have a brief um, uh, and a summary of the proposal which needs to be shorter and more summarized uh, when compared with the whole proposal. And most of you are aware that um, uh, some of these um, executive summaries will always come in uh, because um, uh, we need to be able to, uh, we need to be able to um, understand uh, the entire proposal um, uh, explain in a brief uh, or in a summary uh, so that if you don't want to read the entire details of uh, what is contained in the proposal, if you go through the executive summary, then you can be able to read uh, those details uh, quite, quite clearly. Now, um, the trick, and um, this is something that we always advise proposal writers, uh, is to make sure that um, if you look at your executive summary, now there are three critical things that you should always be able to address. And one of those things that um, we always need to make sure that we address uh, is the why question, uh, is the how question, and it is the what question. Uh, needs out to, be, to come out very clearly because um, majority of these donors might not be able to have all the time uh, to be able to review your full proposal. And especially if they are just trying to look at uh, which organization to shortlist, uh, they may not be able to have uh, the time to be able to review the entire, um, um, the entire uh, proposal. And um, it is important that um, you can capture their attention in how you're able to do uh, an executive summary. And an executive summary will always be uh, between one to three pages or depending on what uh, the call for proposals actually uh, explains. So you can always be able to see um, how uh, you need to be able to address um, your call for proposal. And um, it is always good to make sure that uh, uh, the, the, the why, the how, and the what uh, is well addressed. Uh, what do I mean when I say the why? Uh, when I say why, I'm saying that um, why um, you want to be able to start the project and also resolve the problem. And then again, also, uh, when you talk about the how, is how you plan to be able to resolve the problem. And um, um, when you talk about the what, you're talking about the goals that you want to reach at the end of the project. That is, what are the results that you're going to bring forth uh, in this particular project? And anytime you do that, it is very easy uh, for your proposal to be able to proceed to the next stage of shortlisting because you will capture uh, the donor's attention um, as much as possible. Now, the next thing is on the project rationale. And, uh, um, and it normally has different um, connotations to it. Uh, one of the things that uh, you'll find is that um, 
uh, in some instances, uh, some, 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 some call for proposals, we'll talk about project justification uh, when they're giving you the format of writing your proposal, or they may also be able to refer to it as problem statement, or they may also be able to refer to it as project background. Um, those are things that um, uh, will actually uh, be able to come in when you think about um, uh, the issue of project rationale, uh, when you think about um, uh, different wordings that can actually be given uh, to it. And, um, and normally um, a lot of proposal writers have a problem with this particular section. Um, uh, you'll always find um, a lot of people trying to struggle. Um, I think um, a lot of my work also involves uh, trying to sit in some selection panels uh, for some of the donors just to be able to um, select some successful proposals for funding. And um, a lot of the times you can tell uh, that um, the way proposal are prepared is like um, a lot of proposal writers would be able to do the other sections correctly, but you'll always find they are not very articulate uh, when it comes to um, 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 putting down their project rationale. And this is a critical section because uh, it is what um, allows you to give an argument uh, in favor of implementing the proposed project. Because if you can defend uh, your project um, 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 uh, rationale, uh, then how are you going to be sure uh, that you actually, um, uh, when you receive funds, you can actually be able to resolve the problem um, that is in this particular place. So, so it becomes very, very important uh, to make sure that um, the project rationale um, actually becomes uh, quite, quite um, uh, important and clear. Again, also, um, uh, when you look at the project rationale, it also gives a detailed uh, explanation of why the project is required. And also uh, it is able to describe uh, the issues and the problems uh, that the community actually faces and how the organization and the proposed project will actually be able to address the issues. And so uh, we're saying here that the issues that are in this uh, particular context that you want to be able to have a project, uh, the problems, um, are you able to really, really bring them out and explain them uh, clearly? and, um, and um, um, try to show how your organization is intending to be able to solve uh, some of these problems uh, using uh, the donor funding. And so it becomes a critical section uh, that we have to be able to justify uh, why we need to actually be able to receive the funds. So, so I have a small statement here. Um, ideally, uh, uh, most write-ups for project rationale will not be a small statement like this. But I just want you to uh, be able to capture your attention on this. This is something, this is an expression that you're giving to the donor, um, um, that you're saying that if, a, um, uh, if the donor is interested in child health, then um, in the project rationale, uh, then you need to be able to convince um, the organization to be able to prove uh, the child health crisis exists in their community and actually, uh, that the project can actually be able to solve it. So, so um, can you be able to really showcase, can you be able to use some statistics to actually be able to show that there's a child health crisis uh, in that particular community? And this is the project that is going to avert uh, or reduce or mitigate that child, um, uh, child health crisis in this particular area. So, uh, so it's a critical component. Uh, we must be able to pay a lot of attention to it uh, because most of the times if we don't pay attention to it, then we will not be able to achieve um, the project as expected. And um, uh, again, also, the other thing is also the project goal. So once you have been able to uh, um, uh, point out your problem, or the issues that are there in the community, and also uh, have been able also to um, um, connect that with why you are being able to ask for funding, uh, then again, you can now go ahead and further describe your project now. So, so this particular section, starting from uh, from this point, now you go um, a bit further in describing um, um, what, um, uh, why, uh, what is in your project, and this is where now the what um, about what you will do. 
uh, basically comes in. Now, the project goal, and in some um, areas is also known as overall goal, or overall objective, so you can get any uh, of those um, um, uh, terms being used. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is a very general, high level in a long-term vision for the project. So, so when I say project goal uh, is what I'm seeing for this project at the very high level, at the long-term level uh, vision for the project, and um, this goal will normally be able to give direction uh, to the project and uh, to the organization. And that's what um, uh, we will always uh, ensure that um, we can actually be able to do it. And um, usually we will always have maybe uh, one project goal only, which can also be reflected in the title of the project. So you'll always find, if you look at the title of the project and you also look at the goal, there'll always be some similarities. Uh, because at times in most of the projects, we ideally be able to come up with um, a one project goal, because as we said, this is just a long-term vision uh, for the project. And that's why we might not be able to have uh, a lot of statements expressed uh, in this. Uh, but really, um, the other thing is, um, um, is basically, uh, is simply, uh, to be able to um, uh, is simply to be able to understand uh, that when you want now to break this goal um, uh, into several statements, then now uh, you can be able to think about um, uh, the project uh, uh, objectives. Uh, but just before we look at that, uh, let's just look at some of the examples that you can actually be able to use to coin your project goal. Uh, you can see for this project, um, it had a very um, specific project goal. I just talked about end child labor. Uh, then uh, you could also have another one uh, where you're talking about um, providing housing facilities uh, for earthquake affected victims. And also you could also be able to have another one uh, that's a bit longer, uh, reduce the impact of natural disaster on communities that actually belong to the equatorial region uh, in that particular country. So. Uh, so those are some of the goal statements uh, that could be possible there uh, for, for you to be able to have. But now, what do we specifically uh, look at when you talk about project objectives? So project objectives are basically now your specific achievements, uh, which the project aims to be able to complete so that it can realize that project goal. So, so what are those specific achievements? And... Um, um, project objectives also, we, we normally say it is important that you check whether they are directly addressing the problem uh, that has been addressed, uh, that, has, um, that, has, uh, that has actually been described in the project rationale. Uh, so it's always good to make sure that um, you can always relate back um, the project objectives to the project rationale um, as well. So, so it becomes very, very important to be able to look at that. And um, uh, most of you um, are aware of this, that uh, a lot of the times when you come through project objectives, they always tell you, make sure your objectives are smart. And um, uh, even in most call for proposals for donors, uh, you luckily realize that um, the objectives are actually determined that they should actually be smart uh, so that it is actually easier to be able to design activities and indicators uh, so that really becomes important. And then again, also, um, if you want to be able to look at a very, very specific example uh, that should actually be able to help us uh, in being able to understand objectives, uh, then we have an example there that we can actually be able to look at. Uh, so that example is a really good example for us to be able to look at the objectives about um, how to phrase an objective. You can see in this particular example, uh, we're talking about um, reducing by 25% the number of girls uh, that are working in carpet factories in City X. Uh, so, so that's a very uh, good smart objective uh, that we can actually be able to use um, uh, in defining the objectives. Um, then when we move further, uh, of course, another important component that comes out there is project strategies. Now, what you'll find, most proposal, call for proposals might not ask you uh, to, to put down your project strategies. Rarely would you be able to find that. 
But one of the things that we are saying that um, you need to be able to connect is that um, the, 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 your interconnection between your project objectives and project activities uh, should actually um, um, uh, be, be connected through a discussion on what strategies does this particular project want to be able to look at? Uh, or rather, what project areas uh, does this particular project going to be able to look at? And so when you talk about strategies, we are simply saying that these are broad concepts uh, or approaches or methods um, uh, that will actually be used in achieving project goals and objectives. Um, I think some calls for proposals talks about project methods or project methodologies. Um, so you might find those terminologies, either strategies or methodologies or methods uh, that you're going to be able to use so that you can achieve your project goals and objectives. And um, these ones normally um, are good in uh, providing direction uh, in project um, uh, implementation. And um, good examples of what you can call strategies is like you will have a project that looks at capacity building, awareness raising, um, organizational development, research, um, uh, etc. Um, um, as you can see. And then again, also, when you look at project activities, uh, what are the actions that you can actually be able to undertake uh, within these strategies? And um, uh, these are normally the smallest identifiable measurable pieces of work plan for completion throughout a project. And project activities really become important to define them, uh, particularly when we are putting our work plan for the project. And uh, I will be discussing some few details about the work plan, uh, just to be able to um, clarify that as much as possible. Now, so it's always good to make sure that, um, uh, of course, activities are related back to the objectives uh, by, by making sure that you're able to define your strategies um, quite, quite clearly. And um, uh, it is important that um, we, are able to, uh, we are able to look at that. And um, again, um, uh, ensuring that um, that can, can actually be very well clarified. And, and just to help you picture like the difference between strategies and activities, I think I have a table here uh, with some examples that should be able to clarify that for you, uh, because if you look at strategies, uh, we are looking at um, uh, if you have a strategy like raising awareness, what kind of activities can you be able to do to raise awareness? Uh, of course, you will do uh, things like um, um, conducting social media coverage, um, uh, undertaking public demonstrations or conducting rallies. If you look at organizational development as a strategy, then it will involve training or um, staff selection. Uh, if you look at research and development, then you might talk about conducting a baseline survey, uh, conducting focus group discussions or conducting PRAs. And um, also on advocacy, you can also be able to use um, some of those uh, strategies as much as possible. So, uh, so, so it's very, very important that we get to be able to understand uh, that as much as possible. And uh, now, um, um, as I said earlier on, I, I want to be able to pick uh, some questions at some point. Uh, so, uh, so no worry. Um, I think just note um, the slide number uh, that uh, maybe you want to be able to ask a question and I will be able to um, uh, just basically uh, respond on that as well. So, so no worry. Uh, we'll be able to handle uh, your questions um, um, as we go along. So let's look at um, 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 some uh, some component as well, uh, some extra component. And this is what we call project results, because now after you have been able to define your project uh, strategies and you've been able to define your project activities, then the other thing, and this is something that uh, most donors will be trying to look at is what kind of results um, are we expecting to achieve in this particular project? What form of results uh, do we think we can actually be able to achieve uh, in this kind of a project? And um, results, of course, are broken down into, uh, into three. Um, I would always want you to make sure that you visualize results into three. We've got what you call project outputs, we've got what you call project outcomes, and we've got what we call project impacts. As, as, as a long-term result. And um, it is always good to make sure that um, we are able to recognize that as much as possible. Now, if we look at project output, 
Um, we, we normally say these are the immediate results that will normally be achieved soon after completing an activity. Um, uh, for example, project training local, um, uh, local people on human rights. Then you will talk about um, 20 community workers who are trained in basic human rights concepts. Um, and then if you look at um, uh, project uh, uh, outcomes, um, um, uh, these ones will be the short-term results. So it means more than immediate. Um, um, and this will be achieved after a time period of time. And um, uh, using the same project example, then you will be able to say that this, um, um, uh, people who are trained on basic human rights, uh, the participants were able to use their training to inform other community members about their human rights. And uh, that's something very good to be able to achieve. Uh, but what about the project impact? What does this outcome uh, lead to um, in, in terms of a longer term result uh, because of the outcome that was achieved. For example, three years later, uh, what are we expected to be able to see? Uh, then uh, because of people getting awareness of their human rights, then we are expecting that the election voting patterns will have changed significantly uh, in three years. And um, um, for example, the country uh, will actually be able to vote against the leader uh, who has had a history of human rights violations um, as much as, 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 as you, can, you can be able to see that particular result. So, uh, so it's important uh, to make sure that we are able to note um, uh, something about uh, project uh, results as well. Then again, also, uh, if you move um, a little bit further, uh, uh, there's also another critical component uh, beyond just telling us these are your results, um, we, we don't actually just get um, um, uh, satisfied by that. You can detail your results very well. But then again, if you don't tell us specifically how you're going to monitor and evaluate um, so that you make sure those results are actually achieved, and this is what we are able to refer to as our m and &E plan um, as much as possible. So, so it's very, very important. Uh, to make sure that um, we actually uh, need to be able to look at that. Now, it is important to make sure that we have a well-defined ME &E plan uh, so that we can be able to monitor the project activities and also to make sure that we evaluate the results of the project. So it's always good uh, to make sure that we, we get a very uh, well-defined uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, plan that will help us monitor the project activities also will help us evaluate the results of the project. And then again, also, uh, it is important uh, to differentiate between monitoring and evaluation because these are two concepts, uh, but they are very, very uh, different from each other. And I think it's good uh, that we can actually be able to get the difference between the two concepts. So when you talk about monitoring, uh, we are talking about uh, measuring and documenting progress, achievements, results uh, throughout the project. Uh, whereas when you talk about um, evaluation, you're talking about the second step in the approach where uh, the data you collect in the monitoring processes is analyzed and evaluated uh, to determine whether the project results have actually been achieved or not. So, uh, so that's what we are able to refer to uh, when you talk about um, the monitoring uh, and evaluation plan. Now, normally, um, if you want to be able to put a good m and &E plan, um, as we always say, it's always good to make sure that you can showcase uh, your results, as you can see there, and our objective statements. Uh, if you can show your indicators that you're going to use, if you're going to show us the methods that you're going to collect data for your indicators, uh, what will be the timing and frequency, who will collect that data, uh, who will be the respondents, what kind of analysis are you going to do for your project? Um, are you going to do uh, what you call uh, data disaggregation, which is becoming a very critical component nowadays, uh, where we want to analyze, but we also want to disaggregate our data. And then um, how is that information going to be used uh, in communications and decision making for the project? And um, uh, anytime you're able to present that kind of a plan, uh, it actually becomes very, very uh, critical uh, for us to tell that this project has a very good uh, strategy for monitoring and evaluation. 
Now, again, also, um, it is also good to make sure uh, uh, that we are able to uh, also uh, specifically uh, look at the project budget uh, because uh, the project budget is quite, quite um, critical and, um, um, and it's a very, very important component. Remember, at the end of the day, you're doing this proposal so that you can get funding. And uh, uh, it is always good that you don't look at the project budget as the last thing that you should actually be able to look at uh, in a proposal, but you should always prioritize it and know that um, uh, if I don't define this well, uh, then um, uh, there's a likelihood that um, my budget will not please uh, the donor, uh, or the, the evaluator of the proposal. And um, of course, um, if we can get any value in the project budget, then why would we even be interested uh, in the entire uh, concept of the project? And so uh, it therefore becomes important to make sure that we can allocate, um, uh, we, can, um, uh, we can be able uh, to ensure that we allocate uh, to implement the activities described in the proposal. Now, um, I just want to introduce you to two ways of preparing your budgets. I know uh, most of us maybe have been used to just one way of presenting the, the budget and um, why it is important to be able to look at um, the two different methods of preparation of the budget uh, is because you might deal with a donor who might prefer one um, and, and another might prefer the other way. And um, it is always good to make sure that uh, uh, you can always be able to have um, um, a way that you can use to present your budget. Uh, so, uh, so one of the things that um, we will always uh, be able to use um, is, to, uh, is to get uh, what we are referring to as um, an activity-based budget. And this one uh, simplifies your budget making process because uh, you can just go to your work plan, extract your activities, uh, determine um, uh, what are those activities, split them into smaller items, and ensure that each activity has a budgetary item assigned to it. And you can present your budget um, based on, um, uh, on those activities. Now, why do people like it? Um, it is very easy to understand, and it is also very uh, easy to prepare as well. And um, that's why it becomes very, very important. A good example is like what I'm showing there in that table, uh, where you can see um, our, our expenditures um, are classified based on activities. Uh, then, of course, we can state the units, the number of units, the unit rate, the cost. And as you can see, we have some two activities there. That is preparation of the annual conference and also training of the volunteers and um, the categories of expenses in that activity are done. And uh, we are able to get the total for activity one, and then also get the total for activity two. And um, both activity one and activity two gives us the total. Quite, quite straightforward uh, to be able to prepare. But ideally, most of the times you will not always find um, a donor asking you for an activity-based budget. Um, actually, one of the things that you will always be able to um, come across uh, is that um, you might be able to find a donor uh, who basically um, um, wants you to prepare a line, uh, a line item budget. And um, one of the things that uh, you need to be able to understand about this kind of a budget is that um, instead of organizing uh, the budget uh, using activities, um, basically this budget uh, organizes expenses uh, using line items um, uh, or cost items and um, it is able to sum, um, lump up together uh, these similar kinds of costs into one budget item. And this could basically mean um, anything to do with transportation is put under the transportation um, budget item. Anything to do with training is lumped up together in training budget item. Anything to do with training materials, it is also um, a lumped up into uh, one budget item as you can uh, you, as you can actually be able to see. And um, that also um, uh, is a way also you can present your budget. And this, this budget normally uh, is a little bit more difficult uh, to be able to prepare. And uh, we will always be able to have some challenges uh, when you're asked to prepare this. It takes more time to prepare than the activity 
based budget. But this is how it looks like. Uh, if you can see from that uh, below table that I've presented there, you can see expenses are listed either as, uh, uh, as trainer, as uh, personnel, as services, and other costs. And um, you're able to indicate those uh, expenditures, fill up their units, number of units, unit rate, cost, and then you can be able to get the total uh, for that particular budget. Now, those are the two um, uh, critical methods that you can always use to make sure that uh, you prepare your budgets. But then again, now, what are some of the critical considerations that you should always be able to be uh, very, very aware about the budget? Because we see it, uh, in your proposal, your budget can make or break uh, your success with, uh, uh, with funding. And um, it is always good to make sure that we understand what are some of the critical tips on creating a great budget. Now, as I said earlier, um, a lot of people tend to ignore this and make it like the last thing in the proposal writing. In fact, um, and I always uh, say that this should even be the first thing that comes in your proposal writing. It's only that uh, you can make it the first thing because there are a lot of components that you need to make sure that you define in your proposal so that you come uh, to the budget. But this should not be the last ignored thing uh, in the proposal. So, so it's always good to make sure that you prioritize it, uh, make sure that you have all correct numbers and sound budget, uh, make sure you choose one format, don't mix formats, don't go activity, and uh, at the same time do line item. Uh, so it's important you choose a format uh, that you're going to use. Uh, check your mathematics, uh, not only once, to make sure your numbers add up because really, uh, if you're presenting us um, uh, wrong calculations, how do we tell that uh, you don't have, you have an intention to be able to uh, implement the project successfully if you start making mistakes at the proposal stage. So it's very, very good to make sure that you can be able to look at that. Uh, calculate realistically with real uh, numbers uh, so, so that you make sure you do not underprice or overprice and make sure that you include everything as there are very many types of costs that will be involved in a project. Uh, make budget writing a group activity. Don't do it yourself. Uh, try to work it out with some colleagues um, uh, in your organization. Uh, think about the inflation or exchange rates. Uh, always make sure you keep these uh, changing prices in mind and also include the margin uh, that, is, um, um, that is in your proposal. Then it's also good to make sure that you explain extraordinary cost in budget narrative. Um, otherwise, make sure that the budget is self-explanatory. Uh, that is why we have a component known as a budget narrative uh, that basically gives us some further details uh, just to make sure that we can be clear about uh, some of the cost items that we put in the budget. Uh, it's always good to make sure that we are clear. That is why we have the budget uh, and narrative. Now, um, again, another thing, um, uh, it is always good to make sure that um, uh, we, we need to, uh, we need to uh, make sure uh, that we can uh, we can actually be able to do uh, that as much as possible and um, uh, it is always good to make sure that um, uh, we can always um, avoid um, that and um, um, uh, it is always good to make sure that um, uh, we can uh, we can always ensure that um, uh, we are able to um, have someone uh, who is able to read our budget uh, in the context of our proposal Uh, in the context of our proposal as much as possible. So, so it's always good uh, to make sure that you allow someone to be able to proofread your budget um, um, uh, as much as, as possible, to make sure that everything is actually clear. Now, again also, um, there are also some um, 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 three more components that are critical to make sure that you include in your, in your proposal. And um, one of those ones is what we call the project work plan or the gun chart or the project timeline. Uh, it's always very, very uh, critical to include it. Um, it includes um, uh, each step in implementing the project and um, how each step will actually occur and how long and who will be responsible uh, to be able to do that. 
And one of the best tools for developing a work plan uh, is simply a Gantt chart. That is a table that basically summarizes and visualizes the schedule or the timeline of the project. So uh, important to make sure that we prepare uh, the Gantt chart using either Microsoft Excel. Uh, but nowadays, I think we always want to make sure we can use better tools. A Microsoft project can create a better work plan or a better Gantt chart than Microsoft Excel. So um, um, make sure you get uh, this sophistication. It might be able to please the donor. So make sure you can work out your work plan uh, in Microsoft project. And um, it's, a, it's a very important software to be able to use. Or there are other softwares that also you can be able to use to prepare your, your work plan. And um, the one that I'm showing you there, has been prepared using Microsoft Project. So for some of you who may want to be able to use this to prepare your work plans, uh, it's always good to use Microsoft Project because later on, as you're managing the project, you can also use the same software to manage that particular project. And that's how the work plan looks uh, in, in Microsoft Project as I'm showing you in that diagram. So, um, so get um, some interest in it, and then you can be able to work on it. Uh, then the other component is also the logical framework. Remember, this is basically what uh, defines the project, and uh, it's a matrix diagram uh, that basically um, provides a streamlined linear interpretation of the project design and the desired results that we actually want to be able to achieve. And um, um, out of it, you can actually be able to see that um, we focus on the activities, outputs, outcomes, uh, goals, and impact. And um, we are able to put the intervention, we are able to put the objective verifiable indicators of achievement, sources and means of verification, and also assumptions and risks for our projects. And uh, uh, it's always good to make sure that we can actually be able to fill a logical framework. Um, I think uh, sometimes later on, uh, maybe we will get a webinar just to discuss the logical framework and we can go into the details of what is a sound a uh, logical framework. Uh, but I think in your notes, I will be able to uh, provide you uh, with this explanation so that you can actually be able to see whether you are able to address. And again, also this example for you to review, uh, you should be able to get this example uh, of a filled out logical framework um, as a good standard uh, to make sure that um, you can also be able to um, comply and ensure that um, you are able to give us um, um, some something that is uh, that looks good. Now, again, um, um, another thing that um, is always uh, critical um, is not just um, to prepare uh, the proposal and include all those components, uh, but basically another thing that really, really becomes very, very uh, important. Uh, to make sure that um, uh, we can actually uh, be able to look at uh, is the whole issue of uh, uh, is the whole issue of ensuring uh, that, um, that you can actually uh, be able to um, 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 uh, understand and why um, um, uh, you know, uh, get funded, and um, uh, if you don't uh, look at some of the uh, get funded, um, then you realize, particularly in these COVID times, I've uh, interacted with a lot of proposal writers and they're always telling me, you know, um, I'm, I'm really, really trying to look for funds and uh, uh, it's not actually becoming very, very possible. So, so that's why we thought, why don't we just discuss um, some of the things that make actually your proposals not to uh, get funded. And I think it's very, very important for us to be able to, um, to be able to understand that. And um, uh, one of the things that um, we always, always want to be able to um, 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 uh, align as uh, some of the good reasons why proposals don't get funded uh, is that um, uh, sometimes we, uh, we do not get to know the donor. And then um, a lot of people make this mistake a lot of the times because you look at your proposal 
but you don't look at the donor. Uh, so you 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 you're busy preparing a proposal, uh, but you, but you do not understand the donor. And that is why uh, at the end of the day you'll be saying sent a lot of proposals, no reply. But then again, you have to be able to uh, make some effort uh, to be able to understand the donor. And most of the times, getting to do the do the donor is not so much um, in terms of um, the information that they have probably listed in their websites, uh, but just making some deliberate um, attempts to have contact or to try to um, have some network with the donor, uh, just to make sure that you truly, truly understand uh, what they actually need uh, when they want to be able to give uh, certain funding. Uh, it's always good to make sure that um, you can you can understand what precisely uh, they need, and um, it is important to say uh, that you realize most of these donors have um, a set of priorities, they have a set of concerns, and they have some issue areas that they want to focus on. Most of those things uh, might not be listed in their websites, and um, so uh, just doing some brief donor research and thinking you know it. Uh, might not actually be the case, and uh, it is good that you make an effort uh, to to truly understand what are their priorities, what are their concerns, and what are their issue areas. And one of the most important aspects of any funding proposal uh, is to make sure that you demonstrate um, um, how your project can help uh, the donor to be able to achieve the purpose that they actually want to be able to achieve. Um, so that's one. Uh, that's one of the critical uh, critical areas to be able to uh, understand. Uh, and then again, also another thing is also when you do not introduce your organization uh, before applying uh, is, is also another mistake uh, where proposals end up not getting funded uh, because uh, funding organizations are also trying to look not just to look for an excellent proposal. Uh, but basically, they might want to be able to um, um, uh, get an organization that they can know, get an organization that they can understand, get an organization that they can actually be able to trust. Um, I think recently I was um, one uh, NGO, and um, I was. It was a bit surprising for me uh, when that uh, when the when uh, staff from this NGO uh, were telling me that uh, they've been working for a long time uh, with one major donor. And um, um, I was asking them, I mean, how, how you know that your organization does a lot and we know that your organization um, has achieved a lot of impacts through some of your projects, but, but you know, how do you end up working with one donor for all this time? Uh, for a, such a long period of time, but um, their answer was very, very clear. You know, they have been able to earn the trust uh, for this particular donor. And um, uh, it means like for them, any funds, and this is a well-funded donor, uh, any funds that this donor will actually be able to have knows and understands and trusts this organization to be able to implement. So, uh, so why don't you make sure you do some good contact about your organization uh, before you can actually be able to um, apply or submit a proposal. Another critical error that a lot of organizations also commit, and um, it is something that we really need to check out, uh, particularly uh, in these COVID times when um, we know there's, um, um, there's um, uh, quite some competition for um, uh, the, the availability of funds, uh, is to make sure that um, you're very, very keen on reading the proposal directions carefully and also ensuring that you're able to follow them carefully. Now, a lot of people, um, uh, or a lot of proposal writers are not able to uh, um, stick with this uh, because sometimes they also don't give them enough time to be able to write proposals. So, so you realize um, you want to write a proposal today, the deadline is today and really, it, it will take a miracle for you to be able to follow uh, some of those directions carefully. It's always good to make sure that uh, uh, you are able to read your proposal directions carefully and make sure that you can follow them uh, because um, uh, too many good proposals, uh, somebody who has a very good concept that is going to provide some very wonderful interventions for a particular community uh, can actually be failed because 
they didn't follow the instructions of the donor properly. And um, that is why donors make FT a proposal because you have not followed the guidelines, then you have nobody to blame because the guidelines were very, very, very clear. Uh, so make sure you understand them, make sure you follow them to the letter, uh, make sure uh, that this will not be the reason that your pro proposal will be rejected. Um, and so make sure you're able to understand those instructions uh, very, very uh, clearly. Another thing that we often come across uh, is um, uh, you have done a proposal, and as we said, there's the cover page, there's the executive summary, there's the project rationale. Now, if most of these sections are not captivating, then you don't really expect that the donor will be able to put you in the shortlist. And, um, and that's why we really need to focus a lot on having a very captivating introduction um, about the organization, because remember, um, these donors receive hundreds or even thousands of proposals uh, for just a small number of grants. And um, it is crucial that your organization is able to stand out, is able to capture the funder's attention as soon as they start reading your proposal. And um, uh, myself, I've sat in selection um, uh, committees and I know uh, there's, a, there's a proposal you, you pick like this and it does not captivate you at all. It doesn't captivate you. It's, it's not having something that um, uh, really looks like um, uh, it's realistic. And um, uh, one of the things that you'll always find is that, uh, um, uh, you know, um, because uh, it doesn't capture the attention that you'd expect uh, for some of the com competing number of organizations that are submitting proposals for, for the funds. And so um, we have uh, little funds, we have many organizations that have submitted proposals and we want to make sure that we can select the best. So, so if it's not captivity, it doesn't make, make any reason for you to be able to, read, uh, to be able to read it through. And um, again, also, um, it's very, very uh, important that you focus on a very good introduction for your proposal. Then again, also, uh, it is good also uh, to um, uh, ensure that um, Uh, it is important that um, you're able to um, not keep your proposal simple uh, because sometimes um, it is always good to make sure that you're absolutely clear what your project will do, why it is important, exactly how you're going to be able to use your funding, what results will the project have, um, um, because funding organizations will not just support a proposal unless they understand exactly why your project is important, um, how are you going to spend your money, what are the project outcomes uh, that needs to be achieved? Again, we are talking about results have to be showcased uh, very, very uh, uh, clearly. Uh, and then again, also, uh, it is also good to know that um, uh, proposals won't go far uh, if they are not able to create a funding um, agency. Uh, you know, um, there's a way you put a proposal and you can make the donor have the agency to want to fund uh, your organization uh, because um, uh, it is vital that you're able to show uh, that if your project is um, 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 uh, that is vital that your project is funded immediately uh, because it's causing uh, a worthwhile uh, cost of difference and um, uh, it is always good uh, to be able to identify proposals that are winning and losing um, uh, basically um, by by establishing that your project needs uh, needs to start today, and uh, without it, the situation will actually get worse on ground. So, so creating that funding agency really becomes important. Again, also when you look at some proposals, sometimes you find uh, um, a proposal that that does not have tangible outcomes. Again, we go to the results, uh, and it is always good to make sure that we are able to show clearly uh, what we will get uh, for the money that um, we are actually proposing. Um, again, another uh, challenge that a lot of organizations, particularly small organizations, community-based organizations and small uh, civil society organizations, when they don't do some good online presence. And uh, most of the times I ask some of these organizations, uh, how do you think you're going to get funding when you cannot be able to enhance your online presence 
like most international NGOs. Because if you go to most international NGOs, uh, you realize their international um, their their online presence is actually uh, very very good. And uh, and so in a competitive fundraising one, uh, it is good to make sure that your organization is well represented in the internet because donors will quickly rush to check your website. Um, is it up to date? Does it demonstrate clearly your organization's work? And it's good we invest in a well-maintained website uh, if we want to be able to get our proposals funded. Lastly, proofread your proposal. Always make sure that your proposal is well, uh, is well proofread uh, because um, if there are certain uh, mistakes, then uh, they will always make a bad impression. So uh, um, try to check with your colleague or basically just hide, try to hire an independent proofreader just to make sure that they can check your proposal for spelling, grammar, and other errors that um, you may not be able to come across. Um, and it's always good to make sure that you can, you can check on that. Then um, after saying that, after saying some of the uh, challenges that we will always find that our fund, uh, fundraising um, uh, um, proposals um, uh, are not actually accepted, then it's also good that we get to understand the fundraising environment. So, so what are some of the things that we should be able to understand uh, in this uh, fundraising uh, environment? What are some of the things that we actually need to be able to understand? Now, um, um, there, 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 there's certain things that we need to be able to understand about the fundraising environment and uh, there are critical steps uh, for us to be able to um, ensure uh, that we are able to um, um, understand um, very, very uh, critical um, things. And, and I think one of the critical steps, uh, start by knowing your organization needs. What do you really want uh, in this particular fundraising? Um, um, before you even begin to research for donors, uh, start by examining what are your wants and your needs and looking at where are you going to be able to work. And um, also what area of work are you engaged in? What is your current budget? How much more do you need? You need to be very precise. You don't just need to go for blanket figures. Uh, you really need to be aware that this is the amount of money that we actually need. And um, also, uh, when do you need the funding and for how long? Uh, because uh, the answers on these questions will basically be able to help you to know how to look for donors uh, that basically maybe work in the same country as you, work in the same program area as you, um, you uh, get to know your budget, your grant size and matching, your funding and your project timelines um, critically. So that's the first step, that's the first step uh, you should always be able to insist on uh, as much as possible. And um, the other thing is um, it is important to make sure that um, you research donors uh, that will actually be a very good match uh, for your NGO. Uh, it's always good. This is something that we do not um, uh, take it for granted um, because we need to, um, once you have completed step one, you need to be able to start the research process, um, try some several good techniques to find like-minded uh, donors. Like for instance, you can go to websites or annual reports of NGOs that are doing similar work uh, to you. Uh, check databases and online uh, or physical directories that are there. And I think it's good to mention that uh, um, as, a, uh, as, an, uh, as an organization, uh, Strategia Netherlands has an online and directory. Uh, that you can always be able to subscribe to be able to get. And um, uh, some of these uh, directories you will find is they are free, while others, uh, they'll actually be able to require you to make some payment or some subscriptions that I've seen. And um, uh, some of these uh, directories are very, very good to be able to use. Then it's also good to make sure that we can ask partners and colleagues and um, current donors for suggestions on who can basically be able to um, match our funding needs. I think it's always good to make sure you talk to as many people as possible, uh, talk to uh, proposal writing consultants, uh, talk to proposal um, um, writing uh, organizations, you know, uh, people who are expertised uh, to make sure that um, they can actually be able to help you on how 
uh, to make sure that um, you get information on, on donors that can be able to fund you. Then it's also good to make sure that you network and reach out to the donors before sending a proposal. This is a winning um, strategy. Uh, this has worked for a lot of organizations that I know that are very, very successful uh, in their funding, uh, because um, particularly as you're saying, in this current period uh, where we've been going through COVID and you realize um, a lot of donors um, actually pulled off uh, funding because of the, um, the effect that um, uh, COVID had on economies as well as uh, in the fundraising world. Uh, then one of the things that can always be a winning strategy is before you submit that proposal, then you try to reach out to that donor. Don't just research and feel um, um, uh, you know them, uh, but just try to reach out, reach out via email, reach out via phone or Skype. Um, uh, do not send them a proposal at this point. Uh, rather, uh, just try to ask for an in-person or a virtual meeting uh, so that you can be, get to understand what are some of their priorities when it comes to funding and also make an impression uh, about your organization to them because they may not know your organization and this will give them an opportunity to get to know your organization. Uh, then you realize that uh, uh, most of them will not respond immediately. And this is where a lot of proposal writers give up. Um, I've seen uh, people saying, I've written to that donor and I've given up. But be persistent because remember, uh, they are also getting a lot of um, communication from many organizations and it takes them time sometimes to reply to each of those organizations. So make sure you're patient, uh, but keep uh, being persistent until you can be able to um, uh, uh, get in touch with them. Again, also the other thing is also develop a great proposal. Take your time to um, uh, be able to um, 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 uh, develop a great proposal because if at this point there's a donor that has expressed interest in your work and has asked you to send a proposal, uh, then it is always good to make sure that um, you're able to look at that. Uh, most of the times, the first application you make to a donor will be a concept note, as we defined before, and we said it should be about one to three pages. Uh, make sure you follow instructions to the donor that have been provided as carefully as possible. Um, and the concept note should also be clear and concise, uh, reviewing it for spelling and grammar, and also ensuring that you fully address the, uh, the problem that the donor wants to be able to solve uh, in your project rationale as well. Um, then again, also another critical step is to make sure that you're always following up, you're always persisting, uh, because you need to understand that fundraising is a long-term endeavor. Uh, it is not something that we just do temporarily now and forget about. Uh, there's no time that an organization will always be able to accumulate enough uh, funds uh, for its programming work. So it's always good to make sure that we consistently do this uh, because also success in the fundraising world does not just come overnight. Then it's also good to make sure that you don't give up too quickly. Uh, it is good to be persistent. It is good to spend at least a few hours each week on donor research, on donor outreach, proposal development, and other uh, fundraising tasks. It's good to make fundraising uh, like a usual operational activity for your organization. And um, if you are rejected, always ask donor for feedback so that you can improve, uh, but don't at all give up. Uh, fundraising process is not about giving up. Uh, fundraising process is a long-term endeavor. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. You've got to keep doing it. You've got to keep persisting uh, so that you can actually be able to um, achieve uh, that progress uh, for getting the available funds for your program. Then lastly, uh, we just look at um, uh, now you have submitted your proposal. Uh, what steps should you be able to consider when it comes to project planning and design? And um, 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 uh, when you talk about this, I just want you to be able to consider um, um, this uh, particular uh, critical five steps, uh, where first of all, you need to start with identification and definition of your project. You need to be able to look at um, how to set up your project, how to be able to plan your project, how to be able to implement your project, and how to be able to close your project as well, because projects can't be uh, long running, uh, they have to be time-framed and it's always good to make sure that uh, we can actually be able to define them. 
Um, then again, um, when it comes to identification, um, in this step, we always want to make sure that the teams can define their needs, explore opportunities, analyze the environment, design alternatives uh, for defining your project. And um, it is always good that this particular step gives us um, uh, the strategic and operational framework uh, through which project will subsequently operate. And from there, you can now move to setup, uh, which um, um, basically uh, concentrates on ensuring that your project is officially authorized. The overall parameters of the project plan are defined and communicated uh, to the project main stakeholders and uh, also coming up with a high level project governance structure to make sure that your project is very, very uh, successful. Uh, then again, also, um, once we have the project officially authorized and ready to start, then we can embark on planning. Uh, that is um, ensuring that we uh, the documents that we developed in the earlier steps of the project, uh, such as the proposal document, um, um, basically uh, we can further develop a comprehensive and a detailed implementation plan uh, and uh, supplementary plans like mill plan um, to provide a model for all the work of the project. And these plans are revisited through the life of the project and updated according to the changing project uh, uh, context. Uh, so it's important to make sure that um, we can actually be able to look at that um, as much as possible. Now, um, again, the other thing is also project implementation. And this is where you get to your day-to-day -day work of the project implementation step, uh, where you lead um, the uh, application of the implementation plan, leading your team, dealing with the issues that come in the project, managing your project team, and also ensuring that um, your project integrates uh, with different elements of the project uh, plan um, as much as possible. Uh, and then finally, you also uh, need to make sure that your project comes to uh, the step of the project closure, uh, which basically means that you're able to implement all closure activities that actually need to occur at the end of the project, uh, such as um, confirming your deliverables with the beneficiaries, and uh, making sure that you collect your lessons learned in the project, and completing the administrative, financial, and contractual uh, closure activities of the project. So, so that really uh, becomes uh, quite, quite critical to make sure that you're able to uh, consider uh, that as well. Yeah, so so that's basically uh, what we needed to run uh, around, uh, just um, uh, that uh, one and a half hour presentation uh, so that I can also now be able to take in uh, some of your questions and comments, uh, basically on what we have been able to review. And I hope this has been uh, quite a fundamental um, um, uh, opportunity for you to be able to learn and um, um, it's very, very uh, important that we are able uh, to understand how to work with proposals. Proposals are never uh, difficult. And um, a lot of the times um, um, when I've um, been able to guide proposal writing or have written proposals myself, uh, um, I've not had challenges uh, that people keep complaining about that we were not funded because a proposal is just about understanding the requirements, understanding the donor or the audience that is receiving the proposal and exactly giving them what they are asking for. And um, after that, just ensuring that you have um, the, um, um, you have the, um, uh, you have the operational manpower to be able to implement that project as designed and to turn it into a successful project uh, as much as possible. So, uh, so those are some of the critical things uh, that we need to make sure uh, that we are able to emphasize um, as much as possible. So, so it's always good uh, to, to be able to have that. Now, um, depending on the time that I have now, um, uh, John, um, uh, how, how, how many minutes could I have for questions and comments? Um, thank you very much, Steve. Um, I think let's give you five more minutes to take uh, questions. And then we invite uh, Evelyn uh, to um, do her session very quickly uh, because uh, we lost her. So let's let's take um, three questions, please. Uh, uh, and then uh, we hand over to Evelyn. 
Uh, very okay. fast. Um, the first question I see is from um, Abdul Shakur. Abdul Shakur, Shakur, please go fast. Let's make it fast. Uh, you know, we are again trying. Nick, please unmute Abdul Shakur. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abdishakur Adan from African Social Development Fo Focus from Kenya. I think uh, I'm very happy uh, uh, to learn Mr. C Steven, and he has done a wonderful presentation. And this, this is where most of the organization has weakness. Um, but there's a challenge that most of the most of call for proposal nowadays or concept, it is a kind of a template that demands a certain number of words that may be 500 words from this place to this uh, this part to this part and then some some of the times some of the time when you are developing a concept or a proposal you are being restricted by the donor uh, guide so i don't know how we, we can go about uh, you you may have all this information but how to apply is restricted by the donor that uh, floated the call uh, okay okay Quite, quite a good question, um, Abdi Shakur. I think that's a very, very good question because sometimes we find ourselves in that kind of a challenge um, uh, where we there's a lot that we can write, uh, but then again, we are limited by the words that we can actually write. Uh, what I normally advise and what I normally do in most of my proposal writing is, first of all, um, write your concept uh, regardless of the number of words. Uh, so just have a rough draft where you write your concept and then now use what we call summary skills, you know, where you now, uh, once you have conceptualized your thought, then now try to summarize that to match the words uh, that are required. Normally that's usually the best way to be able to do that because uh, if you don't, first of all, conceptualize your concept, uh, then if you just write based on the number of words, you will miss out uh, to clarify what you wanted to be able to bring about. So, uh, so it's always good um, that first of all, write what you want to be able to have, then use what you call summary skills uh, to make sure that you can reduce uh, your 1,000 words, 500 words by minimizing um, 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 a lot of uh, repetition and uh, also a lot of over explanation just to make sure that you can be able to fit in within the 500 words. That's the strategy that we normally use uh, in most instances when we are writing proposals. And I hope that uh, is very, very clear to you, uh, Abdi Shakur. All right, thank, thank you very much, Abdi Shakur. Uh, Ambrose Okita, please. Um, and then after that, we will give uh, a lady an opportunity. Let's be balanced. Uh, so Ambrose Okita, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. I came a little bit late, I apologize. I wanted to request or maybe ask if we shall be having access to the presentation or the slides which have been presented. Thank you. Thank you, Ambrose. Just to answer you, we will share the presentations uh, and the, the live recording is also available on our YouTube channel. I uh, will be uploaded before the end of the day. You can check it out on uh, Strategy and Excellence. Um, and there are lots of other courses. There are about 16 other courses. So uh, you're welcome to visit and subscribe to our channel so that when we upload new content, you are uh, alerted. Thank you very much. Is there a lady in the house with a question? Uh, let's, let's be balanced. If not, uh, let's have uh, Charles Okwera. Go next, please. Okwera Charles. So Kuera there. All right, if uh, Okwera is not there, Okwera? Okay, let me take from uh, Maxwell, you're far, very fast. That's the last one, because we still have another brief session from my uh, Let's be balanced. You're far, Maxwell, please ask your question. Thank you. Please unmute uh, your farm, Maxwell. We can't hear you.
Your file, we can't hear you. Hello? Hello? Yes, yes, please, please speak. Yeah, this is Charles. Sorry, I had some challenges with connection. Okay, Charles, uh, Charles Aquera. Yes, All right, you. okay, okay, go, go, please speak. Otherwise, thank you very much for the great presentation. I will not ask because the previous speaker has already asked the question I want to ask. Just about if we can access the I think that's all. Otherwise, okay. Thank you. okay, I've already answered you. If we can't get, um, um, I, th I think I think that's it. If you can put your questions on the chat, then uh, we will respond to you. For for the purpose of time, I think we have to, uh, would be unfair to Evelyn if she does not get a chance to do a presentation. So thank you very much, uh, Stephen, always appreciated. And um, let's now invite um, Evelyn. Please, Evelyn, uh, do your quick presentation and then we wrap up. And thank you very much, guys, for your patience. Uh, I know it's been a long two hours, uh, about three hours, two and a half hours. So Evelyn, please, um, thank you. Take the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you so, so much. And I really apologize for all the technical issues that we have gone through today. I hope now it's clear. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome on board. Thank you. So I'm going to be very brief because I understand uh, time is not on our side. And it seems um, Stephen Mushami had actually had a peep on my presentation <laughs> because he has actually done um, like almost what I'd prepared. However, there are some points that I feel I may want to touch on as a way of emphasizing and also maybe one or two new points that are, could also, are also valuable at this point. Now, we are living in very difficult times where resources are shrinking and the needs are growing. We are living at a time when we are in an, a lot of pressure again to deliver on targets, bearing in mind that we are very fast approaching the 2030 targets, the 2030 end of the sustainable development goals. And most development partners are rushing to ensure that uh, these goals are, or rather they meet these goals. We, so we, we are caught in a situation whereby we need resources, but at the same time, resources are dwindling. And why are resources dwindling? First, first of all, we understand that they, they, there has been a bit of shift in among development partners where they have, they, they're having different priorities, for instance, investing in their own economies as opposed to investing in the developing countries like, uh, you know, as, as um, as aggressively as they have done before. The other reason being that um, the, the economic rebasing of some countries, especially in the developing world, where countries, when, where occasionally, or yeah, let me use that occasionally, um, there's an assessment of the economic development of countries and they are rebased, basing on the economic performance. For instance, if a country was a low, in, a low income country, it's promoted or is rebased to a lower mid middle income country. And it comes with all, let me use the word repercussions or consequences, or yeah, it, the, the, that rebasing comes with, with, with its own package. And one of them is that donors reduce the investment in, this, in these countries. And therefore these countries are compelled to look more inwards for resources as opposed to relying on donors. And so that is what, those are the situations that we find ourselves in. I am not, I'm, I'm not speaking here because I am a very good resource mobilizer. No, I am speaking because I lead an organization based in Kenya and we have been doing resource mobilization for quite a while now with sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. So we are coming with lessons learned on what to do and what not to do when doing resource mobilization. And again, in the COVID times, we know resources are not readily available. So how have we been surviving or what lessons have we picked? So like I mentioned, uh, Steve has mentioned quite a number of them. 
but I have a few that I'm going to add. And um, I had a presentation which I'm not going to make. I'm going to share the resources, the, the, the presentations, the presentation after this, but I'm going to make reference to a few slides. And I'll go quickly and say, when you're thinking about resource mobilization, I personally look at it in terms of, uh, it's not, I do not want first to look at the money I need. I first want to look at what, what are the targets? What do I want to do with the available resources? Am I able to meet these targets without necessarily investing, without necessarily looking for these resources? Are there other alternatives that I can implement and still meet my targets, meet my objectives without necessarily aggressively looking for resources? So it's not about the money, it's about the targets using the available resources. Having said that, I will go straight to, in the tips, okay. What you need to do, what you need for successful resource mobilization. So if you could quickly move to the slide that reads what you need for successful resource mobilization. Next, 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 next. There. I have skipped all the other slides because they have been alluded to or somebody before has spoken about them. I just want to say, to talk about um, the organizational capacity or the organization profile, which sometimes from my experience may determine whether you get the resources or not after you have done the proposal or even in your attempt to raise resources. Organizational capacity is quite key. What is the standing of this organization? What is the legal status? Does this, organization have governance. So I have, I have learned for, again from my experience that um, the capacity of, organ of an organization or an institution determines whether a donor has confidence in that organization. And some of these issues or some of the systems that I've seen them being very keen on is one, governance. Does this organization, for example, have a board? Does this board have a terms of reference? Do they live up to the terms of these terms of reference? For example, if the constitution says that the, the board should be meeting on a quarterly basis, are there minutes to show that actually they meet according to the constitution? Uh, does it have structures? For example, uh, systems like, does it have an organogram? Does it have staff? Does it have assets? And this is, for those of us who work in the developing world, we know there has been cases of what are called the briefcase organizations that do not really have any physical uh, presence, but they will do proposals. Um, does this office, does this organization have physical presence? Does it have an address? If someone went to look for it, would you find it? Legal status, is it registered in the country? Has it met the statutory obligations of that country, for example, does it do its tax return? Um, does it meet the registrar's obligations? Is it compliant to the country's requirements? Does it have um, policies that guide the, the, the operations? For example, a strategic plan, human resource uh, manuals, finance manuals and procurement manuals among others. And has this, and I know Steve has, mentioned this in his presentation. Does this organization have a history of delivering? What achievements can it uh, boast about? Um, is it recognized by the powers that be? By the powers but the, that be, I mean, if it's an NGO, is it recognized by the government that it contributes or it complements the government efforts? Um, yeah, about the, Resource mobilization tools, Steve has gone through that. I'll not repeat, uh, but the quality oh. of the proposal really determines. And I think the other thing I would want to add are attachments in the proposal. Sometimes they ask for so many attachments and sometimes you could just forget to attach one. And that may mean that you're not going to get um, 
the resources. Now, allow me to skip to the slide that says resource mobilization strategies. If you could move the slides. Uh -huh, resource yes, yes, yes. Now, this is quite key now, how you can get resources in the, in the, in the era of COVID. With the restricted funding, we need to promote a lot of efficiency. And efficiency is one strategy that gives the development partners confidence that you can trust you with funds. And how do you promote efficiency? One, I have observed that some most donors these days prefer funding coalitions than individual proposals or individual organizations. Why so? This spreads the risk, that's number one. And number two, it promotes leveraging on available resources and skills. That means that um, if, if two organizations come together and they have complementing skills and capacities, then when they are funded, there is, there's, a, there's a probability that they'll be, they'll be, they'll be more efficient in, uh, you try in implementation. Networking. Again, networking is very, very key. This helps you to know who is doing what, which donor is funding what, who has been funded in an area that you have an interest in so that you can leverage on each other. I'll give an example. I personally work on tuberculosis and I do a lot of, I do advocacy. I may be, I may be having an objective of capacity building, but I don't have the resources, but I know another, another organization funded to do resource, I mean, capacity building, and I can leverage on that. We can work together. You hold a workshop, you want to do capacity building in organizational management, and I will come in, work with you, and I'm going to deliver uh, the, 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 whatever the skills that I am supposed to, 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 to train on. So that means we have hit two birds with one stone. So networking is very key for fundraising. And again, uh, leveraging on other, other organization resources. I have been in situations whereby I've had to deliver on, on an objective with no resources completely. And you may ask me how. Like I've mentioned before, what I do, I do a lot of networking and I leverage or I, I work with that institution and I still achieve my objective. For example, we do a lot of engagement of um, parliamentarians, for example, as one of our implementation. And once, you, once an organization calls for parliamentarians, we do not have to call 10 meetings. We can all come together and deliver or make our asks in just one meet, that one meeting. So I found it very um, important. Uh, next, if you can jump to the next one, maybe the, maybe the last one. Yeah, again, is the profiling of this organization. Is the organization known for what is it known for? Are there achievements that has been done before? I think that has been, I had mentioned that before. And what, what do the referees say about this organization? Do you have good reference? Can the, your referees say that your organization is authentic and that it has delivered before? The other most important thing is documentation documenting what you have achieved before, and you can use this documentation to showcase uh, the, your, your capabilities and your capacities. The documentation could be in terms of annual reports, human interest stories. Yeah, something that actually demonstrates that uh, you, you have been able, like, yeah, you can deliver. And I quickly now jump to my last slide, which is on challenges. Yeah. The challenges now that we, we are going through right now is the dwindling funds from development partners. And what is the solution to that? This means that now we have to look for resources from our domestic sources. This means that we have to look for, for example, the private sector and what is it that they can do without necessarily going to, you know, looking for what donors out there. Um, Reprioritizing, yeah, like I mentioned, the donors are really reprioritizing. That means that uh, development in our part of the world are no long, is no longer a priority for them. Again, we have to see how do we still meet our obligations with what we have. Yeah, the issue of emerging and competing issues like COVID and internal conflict, really, 
And then advancement in technologies, which has really necessitated a change in approach to how we do things. In, the pre in our previous life, I call it BC, before Corona, we had a lot of physical meetings, we had a lot of travel, which are not necessary now. Right now, we have delivered a very successful webinar. If it was before COVID, trust me, could have all traveled to Geneva. John, you'd have had a lot of work. Sorry, not Geneva, Netherlands, yeah? Yes, a lot of resource mobilization to bring all of us here. But within two hours, we've been able to, 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 to meet you know, our objectives. So looking into how to work within technology to cut back on our expenditure, to cut back on our financial needs and still deliver. I will stop at that because I, well, I had a lot to say, but because of time, allow me to stop there and I will take questions, hoping next time we shall have no technology uh, issues and I'll have time to talk more. Thank you, back to you, uh, John. Thank you very much, Evelyn, um, and thank you for your patience. Um, I know you have uh, many years experience working with nonprofit. So, and uh, with regard to your presentation, let's take uh, two questions and then uh, we wrap up. And thank you very much for your patience. Um, yes, I can see the first question from uh, Victor Ogbole. Uh, Steve Kamwendo. Steve Kamwendo, go first. I think you are top. Uh, Steve, go first. Uh, Nick, Steve, please. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. Yes, uh, I'm Steve Kamando from Malawi. I work as a resource mobilization officer for a local faith based organization in the country. I would like uh, to find out from this uh, forum uh, uh, whether there could be some opportunity uh, to link us with uh, uh, potential donors who could fund our programs. Uh, particularly what I'm referring to is something like, you know, a donor mapping uh, where maybe uh, we could uh, make a reference in terms of where uh, to find, you know, potential donors to fund our programs. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Steve, uh, I think I can respond to that question, but Evelyn can also add, we have put together a donor directory with about uh, 2,500 donors. Uh, you could send us an email, you can share the same uh, with you, and then uh, you can figure out um, uh, donors for different uh, thematic areas. Uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, I don't know if you really need to uh, uh, answer that question on how people can access donors. Yes. Uh, so in that uh, regard, may I request if you could uh, also share your contacts uh, so that we can uh, reach you easily on this one. Okay, we'll do that. Send an email to info at .nl, um okay. and we'll be able to uh, um, assist you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, let's take another question from Victor Ogbole. Victor, please uh, raise your question to Evelyn. Nick, please unmute Victor. All right. Um, good day. Oh, we can't hear you. You're breaking. I think let's take another question. Can anyone um, can hear you, me? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Please proceed. All right. Let's take a question from Ahab Munir. Ah. Victor, are you on? Okay, we, we've lost you. I have Monir, please. Nick, please unmute. I have Monir.
Nick, please unmute uh, Ehab Bonir. Nick? Nick, are you there? Please unmute Ehab Bonir. Given you permission to unmute. I can't unmute him. All right. Um, Evelyn, if you have uh, closing remarks, then I'll ask Beatrice to give a vote of thanks. And uh, thank you very much for your presentation. We'll, really, we'll give you a session to uh, handle your whole presentation. Uh, we'll plan again uh, in the coming months. And thank you very much. Uh, so if Beatrice, uh, Evelyn, please, if you have closing remarks, then uh, we ask Beatrice to give a vote of thanks. And then we close. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, I have continue. a few words. I have okay. a few closing remarks. Wait, wait. I think Ihab has a question. Ihab, please continue. Hello? Proceed. Ihab, please uh, proceed with your question. Nick, you have muted uh, Ihab again. All right, Evelyn, proceed. We've lost Ihab again. Evelyn, please. Okay. okay, my ending, my parting shot is, I would want to emphasize on efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Um, I don't see us getting back to where we were, where resources were readily available. I see us uh, heading even to maybe more difficult moments in, in, in resource mobilization. And therefore it's where we have to stretch the dollar it's where we have to see how much we can do with what is available. Is how we see how we can um, how we can leverage on technology to promote efficiency. As like I mentioned, we have been able to do. The targets are still waiting for us, and no one else is going to meet them, and no other resources are coming. So let's think efficiency as a strategy for resource mobilization. Thank you. Looking forward to another session. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Thank you very much. And now I invite Abitis to do uh, closing remarks and vote of thanks. And um, from my end, uh, I want to thank everyone for participating. Uh, Beatrice, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all our participants. I want to take this opportunity to say thank you for the time you took out of your busy schedule to come and uh, be with us this, uh, an entire two hours plus. And uh, to all our presenters, I also want to say thank you uh, from uh, Jim, Scott, Steve, Victorine, Rachel, Joan, Evelyn, and I like the parting shot, efficiency as a strategy, but that has taken off the day. Uh, to all members of staff who also worked tirelessly to make sure that this uh, became a success, especially the technical team led by Nikron, to say thank you. We appreciate everyone that was present today. And uh, I would like to say that uh, we will have more of such sessions. And even as we organize them, we'll still communicate uh, just like we did, uh, we shared the communications. Uh, for now, you can still uh, find the live uh, presentation on our YouTube channel at uh, Strategia Netherlands. Uh, have a blessed day, blessed evening, and blessed night to everyone.
thank you so much. And uh, don't forget to register for the courses as was uh, shown by Rachel and Victorine. Thank you. Are you interested in building a career in the development and humanitarian sector? Then, Strategia Netherlands is the best option for you. We offer training solutions to the United Nations, governments, NGOs and other development organizations worldwide. Make your online application now for Diploma in Monitoring and Evaluation. Diploma in Grants Management, Diploma in Conflict Management, Diploma in Disaster Management, Diploma in Water Sanitation and Hygiene, and many more. The cost for diploma courses is 800 For more information. It's no secret that Africa is the help you build your network among respected entrepreneurs and business leaders and guide you on the opportunities available and Business Club will also introduce you to our team of African business mentors and fellow investors, all tailored to your very own needs. Among the modules covered are Doing Business in Africa, Raising Investment and Trade Finance, Importing from Africa and Exporting to Africa, Agribusiness Opportunities. for online diploma business courses with a flexible learning schedule. Some of our courses include Diploma in Digital Marketing, Diploma three months while diploma courses run for six months and you can register at the beginning of every month. The cost for certificate courses is 500 euros, while diploma courses cost 800 euros. Take action and register today. For more information, contact info at strategiabusiness.com or visit www.strategiabusiness.com.